Hey, and well, welcome. Uh, here's a first. So uh, I and a certain Dr. Franken, aka Mr. Larry Bolheis, have been threatening to do this video for more than a year. If you're joining us, thank you. Uh, buckle up, it's going to be a long ride. Uh, it's a video, you can fast forward at any time. You might wonder what this is about. Well, Larry, would you've given this presentation before, but would you mind summarizing what we're about to talk about? Sure, thanks, Brad. The 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 whole uh, genesis of this thing um, was early on in the in the hosting environment around Power Six, uh, and what we started seeing was we have multiple options now to use as the host partition on your power system. And some people are going to say, well, why wouldn't you use IBM I as your host? And others are going to say, why would you use IBM I as your host when you have BIOS? And so, how do you decide? And we came up, uh, I actually did this thing for the first time a long, long time ago at the Omni User Conference in Chicago, Illinois, US. So um, that was the first presentation a long, long time ago, and it's grown a lot since then. Fantastic. Well, this is something that, you know, you and I live on a day to day basis. So I guess we have our biases. Uh, and, uh, you know, on that uh, elk, we should probably put some sort of disclaimer up uh, as to what we're going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about. Um, so for those of you who have been to an IBM presentation before, I'm sure you'll be used to seeing IBM disclaimers. Look, that's something like this. Okay, I'm sure that you and your legal departments read them all, enjoy every single word. Well, Larry and I don't believe in, um, in having legal departments in our vast international organizations. So our disclaimer looks like this. We have tried ever so hard to make this look, uh, to, to make this right. Yeah, we've, these are uh, our opinions though, they're not facts. So remember opinions are like buttocks. You know, we all have them and you're hearing ours not the views of commons, not even necessarily the ones of our, our, our respective companies. These are our opinions. And as such, uh, we'd like you to remember that whilst we may not be correct, your opinions might not be right either. So put another way, please don't sue us. This is supposed to be a little bit entertaining and a lot informative. You're going to see a lot of content uh, and you'll be able to jump backwards and forwards for things that are relevant for you. Uh, hopefully we'll make it somewhat interesting along the way. Hey, Larry. Indeed. It, 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 hopefully you'll enjoy this. That's the key, right? Yeah. So we, I like to start all my presentations with a why we are here. <clears throat> and in this particular case, if you look back a long, long time ago, we gained the ability to host Windows servers way back when this operating system was known as OS 400. And those things weren't very powerful, but they existed. And our hosting environment was born at that point. Some of you may even remember hosting OS2 and NetWare, and, and there was a firewall in there. Remember um, PhysiOp? <laughs> uh, you, you took it. I was giving my bonus question. File serving, input, output processor, my PhysiOp. Right. And, and if you remember the location where these things are stored, even today, it's QFS, right? That's where them things are stored. So yeah, I always thought the F stood for something else. Now you've taught me something. Yeah, there you go, right? So... That was a long time ago, and things have changed since then because sometime later, um, when we had the name iSeries, we had the ability then to host Linux partitions, and um, I, I worked a little bit with the certification for that way, way back then, and we played around with hosting Linux. Um, then in 2004, we got Power 5 processors, and um, along with the ability to host AIX, so we, it kept getting better. Um, then there was Power 6 and, and IBM i6.1. Now, you, some of you are going to say, well, IBM i6.1 ran on Power 5. And it did, but you couldn't host IBM i if you were on a Power 5 processor. That was a hardware restriction, actually. And um, that's when it got interesting because we got VIOS as well. Absolutely. And that's where the question came up, right? And so it became, which is better? And that's why we are here. So to proceed on this, we're going to take a side-by-side -side look. We're going to look at a whole bunch of things, 30 plus at least, and we're going to put them side-by-side, -side, and we're going to discuss that a little bit. And we're going to kind of, in many cases, pick, you know, maybe a winner, maybe a, a, a little bit better here, a little bit better there. We'll discuss that a little bit. What we're not going to do is make a choice for you because this isn't about convincing you that one is better than the other. This is about reviewing everything and letting you make a decision. And um, uh, we want you to be able to keep score 
And we're going to give you a little scorecard for that. And um, do want to note that this is based on IBM I uh, 7.4 code level. Um, so it, this, is, this is current. Um, the slide we're going to use, this is what each of the slides, the majority of them are going to look like. We're going to put IBM I on the left, BIOS on the right, and we're going to discuss. So we'll have a bullet point up there in the colored block, and then we'll have some discussion down in the, uh, in the boxes. Now, at the very bottom, you'll see that little box, the advantage slider or indicator. And the idea of that is we've looked at each of these things and we've said, which of the two environments, which of the two hosts seems better here? And we'll slide that thing one way or the other to kind of indicate our opinion of whether one or the other uh, is, is superior in that area. So you'll notice in this uh, demonstration slide, it's right smack in the middle, okay? And um, it moves all over the place. You don't have to agree, once again, it's our opinion as to yep. where the little box goes, um, but it moves about on the different slides. Yeah, and I'd like to point out that this presentation is absolutely free, so you're entitled to a full money-back guarantee. Absolutely, I love that part, it, it, yep. And it's immediate. The, the refund is immediate. Right. Um, this is a scorecard. I'm not going to read this here because effectively this is the agenda, but we put it up front so that you can look at it. And if you want to capture a screen capture of this or so, or so um, these are the major bullet points that we're going to cover as we go through um, the presentation. Exactly. And, and we know that not everything that we're about to talk about is relevant to everybody. You know, we, we wish there were more people like us that actually care about all these things. But if there's one thing that's been burning for you, or if you're coming across this video now, uh, later in the event and thinking, I just want to find out about SAN support. Well, you can see the order, just start scrubbing to the right now, and you'll eventually get to that section. And there will be some pearls of wisdom that we have not made up yet that will be in the past by the time you get there. <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's get started. A few terms, just so that we're clear. A host is a partition that owns the resources. And again, typically this is disk, but also tape, optical, network, that sort of thing. So that, that partition is the host partition. And that's what we're discussing here is the host partition. There are also client partitions and they consume those resources. Um, NPIV is a thing that, you know, most folks in the IBMI world never heard of until they got uh, to hosting. Um, but endport ID virtualization is, is what allows um, a single fiber channel path to carry uh, traffic from multiple partitions over to a SAN or to a VTL or to a tape drive, right? But it, it really is a, a key component to a lot of the virtualization here. And the, the uh, if you will, I don't know if opposing is the right word, but alternate uh, hosting is virtual SCSI. And that's where we have a direct host to client connection. So the host connection, host uh, presents as a, as a resource and then the uh, client consumes that resource over virtual SCSI. So there's no cables involved, it's all virtual. And of course that last one, the FUBAR, we're hoping this will help you avoid the FUBAR, because nobody wants that one. Absolutely not. All right, so we're going to start with user interface. And so here's our first slide. And the key here is GUI support. So the host operating systems, GUI support. What do we got in IBM I? We got access client solutions. When we got Navigator for I. Over on the AIX slash VIOS side, well, we've got the HMC. We might have IBM. If you don't know what IBM is, that's the Integrated Virtualization Manager. And um, that's only available if there's no HMC. It's kind of an alternative. Um, I haven't used that in quite a while, to be honest. And if I'm not mistaken, Brad can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's no longer available on Power 9. Is that true? Yeah, I, I, there's, there's certain caveats that go with it, but it's, it's not something you should be using anymore. And uh, as we look to the future, there are alternatives that are coming along. Now, what I would say to you is if you're not using uh, an HMC, 
you know, and you've got IBM I on there, then really and truthfully, the, it's all the way to the left. You know, why why would you try and use Vios if you don't have a HMC? You know, I, I have built Power 7 and Power 8 systems where you put the IVM on there and the interface is absolutely fine. No, no, it's great. But uh, without that HMC, you, you were limited to sort of um, a, a smaller number of partitions and you did start to run out of steam very quickly. Uh, it also meant that you got a single point of failure, which was that single instance uh, of Vios. Yeah. So if you're going to have a, a single point of failure, yeah, I'm showing my bias at this point, even though I'm going to try and argue Vios a lot of the way. But if I've got one Vios and one IBM I, which one do I think is more reliable? Well, that's a no-brainer for me. Uh, as good as Vios is, it has a great heritage. IBM I is better. No two ways about it. So when we're talking about Vios throughout most of this presentation, I think we will talk about dual Vios, uh, and we'll, we'll assume there's a HMC there. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, Larry mentioned is that, you know, in this slide, that with every release of the HMC code, this Vios integration and GUI, GUIification of, of, of Vios gets better. And that's the truth. If we were to compare this to when Larry started talking about, you know, back with 6.1 in the, you know, uh, the very early, well, a decade ago, there was virtually no GUI available in the HMC at all. And if you didn't know the command line, then you were SOL. And uh, now that's, uh, that's no longer the case. Um, but so one of the things, if you're looking at this in the future, and it's not 2022 anymore, well, first yeah. of all, I'm glad there is a future. Um, <laughs> you'll, you'll now work out which part of 2022 we're in. Uh, the, the, the second thing to say is that, you know, there may well have improved the GUI more on the HMC side. So when you start saying, why can't you do that? Well, you may be able to do it. But we're talking about, you know, February 2022 right now. And the, the new iterations that we're seeing in the GUIs for you know, the IBMI world are heads and shoulders above the GUIs that we're seeing in the HMC and in the, the, the Vios IVM world. Absolutely. Yep, spot on. All right, so now let's switch to command line. And, um, you know, you know who you are if you're a command line guy. And I, I raise my hand. I'm a command line guy. I, I, I love the CLI. And I think if you've been on IBM I more than about, what do you think, eight minutes or is it 12? Um, you, you already start to pick up the consistency in the IBM I command line. And um, as long as you are good at omitting vowels, you too can make up commands and, and they're probably right. But you've got the copy and paste that works tremendously well. You've got F9 and what, a, two years ago, maybe we got F8? Um, yeah, I hear that was quite popular. I will, yeah, uh, I'll just too. smile uh, wryly yeah, <laughs> about that. But yeah, F8 is a wonderful thing. And of course, F9 was enhanced at the time. Oh, F9 with the, with the asterisk. Oh, my goodness. I mean, how many times have we used that? Awesome. And of course, when you, you call Q command, you can, you can see the history or you can make the command screen as big as your entire emulator. And so you can paste in gigantic stuff. Um, and of course, you can you can create batch scripts with CL all day long. And so awesome, awesome horsepower and capability, not to mention, you know, the help key and all the other text that's just constantly there. And I think you got to compare that to the green box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. So look, listen, there is almost no help text. There is a manual in there, but it's very limited. The fact that the, the command line in Vios is case sensitive, you know, and, you know, a parameter of you know, minus dash T and minus dash capital T do totally, totally different things. Right? <laughs> yeah, that is a bit of a problem. Um, but there are some plus points to that command interface. It, once you're used to it, and or, or if indeed you're coming from a Linux background, um, I mean, if you Unix background as well, but there's more people, I think, joining the platform from Linux right now, then that interface is fairly familiar. Uh, you can customize it with these incredible um, inflections, which I think we'll come back to later. Is that how do you get the apparel to work? Well, you type in this very long command, but you know, it then does work. Uh, you can also start to store history, not just from your session, but from other sessions as well. So, And you can script. There's some incredibly powerful work that you can do in the VIOS. So I think from a functionality of how, how into the woods you can get with both of them, how rich you can make them up there on an even par. From a, a usability, I have to say that the IBM I is definitely uh, going to be a winner on that command line. Uh, it has help text. Uh, 
Uh, whereas Vios, if you don't know the command, what you do is you drop the keyboard on the floor, you tap dance a little bit, and then the random combination of keys usually is what you want. <laughs> and well, I, I think you notice the little slider here. It's nearly off the screen in favor of Ivy Mai on this one. It's 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 hanging off the left edge. Yeah, uh, partly. So, and I agree. From our BIOS, so if you were, if you're a bias, right? I don't not BIOS as in BIOS, BIOS as in uh, our, our throughput. If you're used to the IBM command line, then it's so easy to go down this route. Uh, if you are coming from a Linux point of view and you've got to learn the command line, then okay, maybe that slider does need to be more the other way. But hey, screw you guys. <laughs> That's right. And I think Brad does nail it. I mean, it, your background makes a huge difference here. The AIX guys that come in, they, they go, you know, hey, and, and for example, they say, well, but you, know, you can fix some of this up, down arrow thing really easy. It's, it's a simple little thing. You just do that. You go, um, really? You're yeah. making that up. Well, isn't that what coding is? Making it up. But this really works. If, if for those of you that do VIOS, if you've never seen this, you're you're living in a dark, damp cave. Because literally by pasting this goo into your VIOS command line one time, now you get a prompt that includes the name of your VIO server. So handy that um, includes the, the path you're in. And you get up arrow, you get down arrow. So what you're used to if you're a Linux person, um, which is retrieve command form forward and back, and you get all the uh, ability to edit the command line. So um, do be aware, and I found, I hit this just again over the weekend, I upgraded a VIO server from 3.1.3.10, which is pretty close to current, yeah. to 3.1.3.14, which is dead current. And it erased all this again, I had to redo it. Um, so VIO may may throw that away um, when you do an upgrade. Depends on which what's being upgraded. So, but this is real. You can copy and paste this. Um, and uh, do we allow copy and paste out of a video presentation? Maybe not. <laughs> Possibly not. But it's such an easy command. I'm sure they've committed it to memory by now. By now, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Listen, go Google is your friend. You will find this just as we did. Um, that top one is the one to bear in mind was you, if you're new to, to VIOS. When you go into the command line in VIOS, you have a very limited cut down version uh, of AIX with a very limited number of commands. And IBM support may tell you never to type in that first command because the OEM setup env actually takes you out of VIOS and puts you in proper AIX so yes. that you can run more commands. Uh, and then as you head back down towards the bottom there, that exit, it puts you back in VIOS mode again. Uh, the bits in the middle, well, I'll let you figure it out for yourselves. It's fairly yeah. intuitive. And and while you're in OEM setup environment, um, you got to meet Smitty. If you haven't met Smitty, um, then you're not an AIX guy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So config assist on steroids. Uh, again, you'll wonder what these are. If you get into VIOS, then you'll understand. Google is your friend. Absolutely. All right, so let's look at hosting virtual media. And so in this case, we have, uh, are we allowed to have multiple hosted image catalogs? And what, what would that put in an image catalog? I mean, operating system install images, uh, PTF images, uh, pretty much kind of name, name your uh, flavor there. Um, and in the case of IBMI, the answer is yes. Um, your actual limit is only how much disk do you got? Um, and so, they're also easily copied and saved and moved and and um, and you can even say please don't save them because I have you know multiple copies of this so you could save save IO time. But a really key important thing to the way that IBM I handles this is if I have an image catalog and it's got you know seven images in it, when the client is reading that first image and needs the second one, it automatically switches and and ratchets through there so I can install from it or restore from it and not have to worry about that. Um, switching to the next volume, which is not exactly the same in, in VIOS. No, it is absolutely not. It's 100% the opposite way around. And you have to get your timing right as well as to when you actually unmount them and remount them. Uh, otherwise, you can trigger some rather scary looking messages in IBM I. Uh, it works, yeah. You know, it works with uh, better with Linux uh, and AIX because that's where it's designed, where you sort of literally you know, pull the thing out and put it back in again. Um, what I would say is that, you know, if 
you've got a standard, um, if you've he invested heavily in Vios, and so they, therefore you have a NIM server, a network image uh, server on, on your network, then you can embed these images along with the Vios. And so it does make it easier to roll them out. Um, and these images then that you would have would actually have both IBM I and AIX in them uh, and Linux. Now we can do the same on IBM I, um, and you know I'm I'm trying to find the joy in the uh, the way that virtual opticals work on uh, on Vios, um, but it's not quite as good. The other problem we've got with uh, with the the the, the sort of um, Vios presentation is you have to remember to link it to the correct Vios. Uh, it's going to be the one providing the boot partition. Yeah, that can be true. that can be a problem as well. Um, so. Yeah, on this one, yeah, they both work. And uh, if the majority of your world was going to be AIX with a little bit of um, IBM I, or uh, was majority was going to be Linux with a little bit of IBM I, then yes, I can see why you would want to use the repositories uh, via VIOS. But from a functional point of view, if you care about IBM I, uh, then definitely the IBM I implementation is better. And, and Larry, you, you mentioned PTFs and operating systems, but increasingly the ISVs now are making their products and patches for their products available as image catalogs as well. So they just yep. allow you to download them and install them that way. Yep, no, absolutely. And especially as, as, as most of you know, there's no uh, optical volume, no optical device available for a Power 9 except for, you know, a USB plug-in in the front. Yep. And um, so the whole use of virtual stuff, especially through this whole pandemic, who actually went to the office, right? <laughs> so having the image catalog, definitely a big plus, big, big plus. Uh, absolutely. And we're talking about optical there, but uh, there's a tape functionality that's the same. So if you learn this on IBM I to do with virtual optical, you can actually do your virtual tape backups. Um, bit of a conversation for another time, but you can plug those into your cloud providers as well. So if you want to upload them to a cloud of your choice, you can then do those backups to virtual tape and then upload them off site. Exactly. And, and, and a little step further then, as you're looking at these virtual optical things, can we um, restrict them? In other words, if I have um, an IBM I uh, let's suppose I have a 7.4 and a 7.3 partition. Um, it's kind of pointless to share my 7.4 PTFs to a 7.3 partition. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, you can you can certainly restrict um, very easily through the net network server description which uh, devices are shared to which partitions. And um, uh, the default is to allow everything, which was a bad default. And they realized that right away. And then they then they gave us the ability only to restrict. And the problem with the only restrict was when you created a new one, since it wasn't restricted, <laughs> it showed up on everybody. Um, and I, I will say there's one kind of little glitch. OK, it's not a glitch. It's a reading comprehension test. And Brad already knows where I'm going on this, because when you're in the network server description, it says allowed or restricted. It doesn't say device, does it? It says resource. And it's only been since, oh, Friday that I've had a conversation with a customer who read it wrong. <laughs> Why can't I share my optical? Well, because you know his, his optical died, he plugged in a different one and now it's opt 02. Resource, he was smart enough to rename the device to opto one because he thought that's what he was sharing. And that's really the, like I say, it's, it's, it's not, IBM didn't do anything wrong here. That's just that the users tend not to comprehend that it says resource, not device in there. Yeah, so. you, we find this a lot in IBM. You look under the weeds and uh, you can tell it was written by programmers and there was no uh, responsible adult in the way because the terminology <laughs> is always written in the negative. You know, it's the way programmers like to go. Uh, but at least we count from one rather than zero. So that's not the end of the world, is it? Um, so I, I think that the, the other thing that's worth pointing out in, in that regard is that as a free tip, if you're building uh, IBM I virtualization, these virtual controllers that do the restricting, the network storage uh, devices that uh, we were talking about, they're all free. So have two. And the second one purely have for your optical and tape devices, put the storage on one, and put your optical uh, and your tapes on another. Uh, believe me, you, you'll be grateful of that when you're doing your problem uh, resolution and when you're resetting tape drives because there's a problem with the tape drive, not because there's a problem with your virtualization. 
Right, exactly. In fact, uh, uh, you know, I specifically, if my guest partition is, you know, IBM I74A, that will be the also the name of the disk connection, but the other one will be IBM I74A TO for tape and optical. Yeah. And, you know, as, as, as Brad said, that is gold when you realize you've just shared the wrong thing, because now you can vary it off and fix it. And if you vary off the one that has your disk on it, we'll leave you to figure out what that does to the client partition. <laughs> yeah, well, it we'll... comes back. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it does come back. You don't have to reboot it. It's not Windows. Um, That's I right. There's been, there's been a few squeaky bottom moments, as we like to say over here. Uh, I, I'm clenching now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we've, we've, uh, if you've done enough hosting, you've done that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, uh, yes, it does come back. So that's, that's the good news. All right. So now network based, network based install and PTF media. So this is a little bit different connection and not probably technically related to the, hosting specifically but one of the really cool things about the network based stuff in the ibm i world is um you can create a whole stack of these things and 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 as an example in our cloud we have um i6.1 7.1 7.2 7.3 7.4 7. .4, oh we can't talk about that one um and all of them have a directory for an install image directory for ptfs and then a third directory for PTF specifically regarding uh, uh, for upgrading to the next release. Okay, need these PTFs. And I can share that through the network and I can share that all kinds of ways. In addition to that, you can boot from them over the network. And that's probably the single coolest thing because now that I can boot from it, I can use it to do upgrades. I can use it to do um uh, installs and so when you have a lot of partitions you, you don't have to go hey you know brad did you copy the new image over to the partition we're going to upgrade oh i forgot oh wait no i was doing it it was running out of disk space oh crap so that was where i was going to go back right all of that's off the table now um, and you have one uh, we like to say uh, known source of truth this is the current ptf stack this is the current um install image so you know, and if you're an AIX person, um, then you do have that same functionality. It's called the NIM. I touched about it earlier on. Okay. Uh, the problem is that it's not a VIOS thing. It is an AIX thing. Uh, it's not trivial to set up. If you know how to set it up, though, fantastic. Um, but it is like having to learn an entire development language just so you can turn something on. So if you know that language, then, uh, and you're familiar with AIX, then NIM is every bit as flexible as what Larry has described. However, if you, uh, and to be honest, it, 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 it does a few other things to do with um, backups as well that you won't be able to do with the IBM I side in that regard. So there are some advantages to NIM, but it's, it's a big learning curve. So if you're thinking, oh, well, they, they say it's about the same. If you know IBM I, no brainer, you'll definitely use an IBM I network installing. If you know about AIX, probably no brainer there, you'll use NIM installing. If you had to learn either of them, then the slide is in the right place. You've got to learn five commands on the IBM I side. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, exactly. <laughs> you don't have to learn an entire operating system, how to configure it, and then how to do the equivalent of those five commands. Yeah, and, and one other thing that is, if because this stuff, by the way, and this is, this is one of those things I love when I do presentations in person and I love doing presentations in person and I will be at common uh, power up in New Orleans in May and uh, other conferences and, and hopefully uh, more than that. Um, but you ask people, when did this arrive in IBM I? When was this first? And, and people will guess, oh, was that in 7.2? Uh, no, 6.1. Okay, so you weren't paying attention back then. But it does continue to be enhanced. And for example, you can now write to a hosted image catalog. And that's a phenomenal capability. So it does give you the ability to use that, not maybe as your production backup, but you can create a recovery image by writing to an image catalog that's hosted on another uh, partition. And while IBM tends to say it's only supported if IBM I is your host, 
Um, there is documentation out there provided by IBM that shows how to do it to a Linux or AIX uh, host partition as well. So um, new capability continues to come. And um, so, you know, absolutely. This... And in the latest, well, actually, in the latest um, version nine HMC code, there was, it's also in the version 10 HMC code. Uh, they, they made the whole boot from um, uh, network image easier and more intuitive uh, as well. So I think that that helps a lot of people as they were sort of follow the commands and thought, what do I do now to actually start this process? So that is much, much easier than it was. And so speaking from install to H from HMC, yeah. right? Um, this one may be incorrect now on the IBMI side. And if it is, it's because of my ignorance, because I'm so good at doing it from a network host on IBMI that I haven't bothered to dig in to find out if they've added it to the HMC. Versus we know how to install VIOS from an HMC. That's been in there for, ooh. Yeah. Long time. Um, yeah, I, I would say f since version seven started, um, yeah. I, I, I think I might have even had the last wisp of a fringe when that was out. That was quite a long time ago. Yeah, um, but again, if you got NIM, that's that's a you know a very powerful tool, um, and you would probably do the same thing. If you're a NIM user, you probably won't install from the HMC anyway. <laughs> and if I'm an IBM Network install guy, right? Again, I don't use it from the from the HMC, so. Um, and there's, of course, restrictions for all of these things. You have to understand the configuration, but that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Networking support. Oh, I love networking. Give me some cables, right? Um, so this is a simple slide. Do, do they support IPv6? Two yeses. And there's the real question. Do you use it? I have no customers using IPv6. How about you, Brent? Uh, absolutely not. Not not on the inside of their networks. Uh, a couple have tried it and they have uh, fallen foul of it. Uh, let's face it, IPv6 is very, very important for the internet. Mm -hmm. IPv version 4, you know, we've got these 4 billion limitation of a 32-bit address. Absolutely fine. And, you know, IPv6, I think they say there's more IPv6 than there are grains of sand. Brilliant. And that, that's wonderful, but wonderfully confusing. So on our internal networks, for the longest time, I think we'll be using private addressing. Um, I mean, how often do you see people with public internet addressing legitimately in use on an IBM I server? I mean, they may put a public address on there, but I don't think they actually hook it onto the internet very often. Uh, and, and even those that do tend to hide them behind firewalls that do sort of uh, uh, NAT masking uh, to keep them uh, extra, su uh, extra secure. So IPv6 is it's very important. Um, but I don't think we're going to see it on, um, on back-end servers. And that's not just an IBM I statement. I don't right. see it on back-end servers on Linux or Windows. Uh, you know, and we support those environments in our house too, as well as the IBM I platforms. So I, I think that uh, you're safe from version 6 of, of, of IP for, for a while yet. Yeah, and I think uh, Brad mentioned the size of that IPv6 um, address. It actually is the same size as the address space of IBM I. Right. Yeah. So it's massive. And um, I, I forget if you get your own, when you get an IPv6 address block, it's two to the 64, two to the 64th power. That's how big your address block is. It's just unbelievable numbers. Uh, and ironically, uh, if you write out an IPv6 uh, IP address, it does look like a VIOS command. <laughs> that's good it, it does too oh <laughs> uh, yes well how about network aggregation right one of the one of the things we kind of if you're a long time ibm i user one of the big 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 advantages of ibm i is the database and the applications are in the same machine so the the inbound request the machine does a bunch of work and then outbound comes a screen or a report or a PDF or something, right? So, um, or, a, or a response to, to some application. So generally speaking, IBM I has always been very low network utilization, just very low. So, you know, a customer's 100 megabit interface was plenty. And even today, it's typically uh, not a lot more than that, typically. But we do use them for more and more. And so if you're going to especially be a host partition and you've got a bunch of, of clients flowing through that um, network, 
do we show, uh, support aggregation? And the answer is yes. And this was this was way back in 7.1, this showed up. Um, and so up to eight land connections aggregated with, with LACP there. And even without hosting, another free tip, if you are watching this and you don't need hosting, uh, and you've got even if you've got a very small amount of, of network traffic, you really want to use aggregation with a minimum of two ports. And that's to just stop you from accidentally unplugging one cable and bringing your machine down or someone restarting a switch and bringing your machine down. These cards don't fail very often, but it would even protect you against a card failure, assuming that you pick two ports from two different cards, that is. Uh, so it's a no brainer. This is a no charge feature. Um, and you've got those two uh, flavors there, either channel or LACP, depending on what your switch vendor prefers. Yep, and and also just realize that the Ethernet adapter that you put in your power system, I believe, is by a factor of at least two the cheapest adapter you can put in there. So buy two; they're small. I, you know, redundancy is good. I, I agree with Brad; they don't fail much. Uh, but I have had a customer who put up an antenna on their building that had a wireless, and it got hit by lightning, and whole bunches of stuff got fried. Um, so redundancy is good, right? Redundancy is good, but let's just go back to the first point. The thing that fails most often, it's this you know, bit of meat and flesh. Uh, uh, people disconnect cables, the wrong cables all the time. People stand yep. on cables that they don't mean to. Um, yep. to have two, it, you'll be grateful. Uh, as you say, you know, maybe 400 bucks. It, it's, uh, you know, it's some people's allocation of uh, Starbucks lattes for a year. I'm afraid you'll have to give them up for just one year for that piece of just money. one, yeah. And, and sometimes I can't resist telling a story. And this is my absolute favorite ethernet cable story. It is a customer not far from here who he calls me up one morning. It's a Monday morning, he's in a panic. He's on the console, which is a LAN console, that's working, but no users can get to the machine. And so I asked him, could we do an LBL check? He says, what's an LBL check? He says, well, you go to the back of the machine and you look at the little blinking lights, LBLs. And he tells me that on the ethernet cards, the top light is blinking, but the next two down are not blinking. I says, well, the top one is your LAN console, top port always. The next two are, um, you know, an LACP, bundle that goes to the switch he says but they're not blinking he says well i said you better check the other end so he i know where that is i'll be back in a moment comes back in and says well you're not going to believe this they were disconnected i said well okay i, I do believe that and he says and i fixed them he says but you're not going to believe why they're disconnected i said okay hit me he says well they come out of the computer room, they go into the switch room, and they're labeled. And they're labeled AS400. But when the network guys were in here this weekend and saw that, they said, well, we apparently don't need these anymore because I've been told 100 times we don't have an AS400 anymore. We have IBM I. I don't know how this translates, but hoisted by your own petard. Right? Uh, exactly right. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, like, yeah. Oh, it's yep. And um, he says, I am printing the new labels as we speak. <laughs> and rightly so, too. Hey, well, you can't criticize them for that. No, I mean, uh, that one was just such a classic. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, this is this is the kind where exactly hoisted by your own petard indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about bridging, because if you're hosting, You've got a bunch of client partitions. They're on the inside, right? And you've got a network that's on the outside. So how do you bridge that? And the answer is yes. Both of them support that very well. A little different there. Yep. Um, uh, the, the rule about don't putting an IP address on the network bridge for IBM I, I actually don't like that rule because I sell CPU. So go ahead and burn up as much <laughs> as you want. Um, but actually, it will um, it will cause uh, problems on the link. Uh, yeah, so that, the, that statement may, may not mean much to you. But if you've got a nice, shiny new machine, so it's a Power 8 or a Power 9, uh, and, you know, you just don't understand why sometimes this thing seems like hella slow, just start looking at where your IP addresses are. And if there's one on this bridge adapter, change that. And uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We've just stopped you from upgrading your machine. Yeah, yeah. 
And sorry, IBM, if we cost you the sale of another processor, but you know, bummer. Um, but yeah, in, within VIOS, I have to admit this one, you know, it, it, it does work better. Um, and um, especially with the, uh, the large buffer support, um, that process uh, does allow a lot more traffic through um, on the VIOS side. Yeah, and you have to remember that VIOS is actually optimized for network storage. It's one of the things that actually was at its inception. And so there are a number of things it can do to optimize uh, throughput. Uh, you can sort of start to link in their quality of service uh, as well as that jumbo frame, as well as better, more granular control over the networking. Now, that doesn't mean that the network bridging on the IBM I is insecure. That's not the case at all. It is not either unsecured, insecure, any other secure that you would be upset about. Uh, but there are more options to do with, um, if you like, virtualization and ring fencing that and absolutely you're heading into that now as we look at the vlan support yeah a big a big thing um when you and, and this is a big difference i think between um what i'll call a larger company or a hosting environment um versus a small company because the typical small company um has you know two three four partitions they mostly don't use any vlans at all it's just you know we have this the machine it's connected to the network and when you ask them what vlan they're on they don't know which probably means they're on vlan one um and some are even running unmanaged switches so then they're clearly on you know vlan one if you will um but the bridge in ibm i will carry those vlan tags um if you don't know what a vlan is it's um virtual uh lan it's a uh, a separate network that can run over the same cable so yeah it's a piece of metadata that sits around the edge of a, of a data packet that uh, the switch is supposed to respect now from a security point of view you should ignore vlans because it, you can spoof that packet if you have control over the, the network layer but from a network administration and optimization point of view vlans are very useful so you know uh, I don't get hung up on this whole 20 VLANs limit uh, because I don't have any sites that have more than 20 VLANs. I'm not into hosting uh, like my learned colleague over there. And when I need network segmentation, typically I'll stand up a firewall in between the, the segments so I can really put uh, an air gap between the, the traffic that's going backwards and forwards and control it. Yep. So, you know, again, uh, the 20 limit for most people is, is not a problem. I, I, forget how many VLANs I'm up to now, it's more than that in the in the hosting environment. So yeah, and that's important. And I would say that VLAN support, even if you are not doing hosting, if you've got two partitions, just two, you might want to have two VLANs on there. And that second VLAN is purely for use for communication between the two partitions. Yep. So we've got certain people who they just got a second partition and that's where they put their sensitive data. Maybe it's their credit card data, maybe it's their GDPR data, whatever data is you know, really, really important to them. And that data is accessed from their ERP system through a VLAN. That there is no physical wire. There is nothing to sniff. And so therefore you can have these incredibly fast connections using the jumbo packets without ever rooting it outside of the, uh, of the, of the box. It's great for your auditors because you say, yeah, go ahead. Try and sniff it if you can. Exactly. Yeah. It's never exposed to the outside world. So good luck with that. Yeah. So a new thing that has um, shown up in, in more recent releases is something called VNIC. And um, if, if you don't know what SRIOV is, we'll forgive you on that. Uh, but um, some of you may remember the Power 6 and early Power 7 machines had this card in the back um, that you could partition this thing uh, and give a little slice of an Ethernet port to multiple partitions. Yep. And um, the HEA, thing, host, host Ethernet Adapter. Host Ethernet Adapter, the HEA, exactly. And it was a good thing. Uh, it was kind of cool. Um, initial setup of the thing was a little wonky because if you used a big number, you got few number of clients. And if you used a small number, you got a big number of clients. And you could only change it by shutting everything down. Yeah, and, and it had another glitch, and that is if if it ever did fail, you had to shut down because it sat on the uh, on the bus, right, on the HSL bus. So whoops. But they replaced that with SRIOB, and that stands for Single Root IO Virtualization. In other words, I have this card 
sitting there and I can allocate slices of it to different partitions. So multiple partitions see the same slot, kind of cool. And um, then the card can also have multiple ports. They make various uh, flavors. And one of the most common ones has two 10 gig ports and two one gig ports, and you can slice them up all you want. But the problem with the SRIOV card is it's a piece of hardware. Now, I'm not against hardware, but if it's a piece of hardware and I'm trying to do things like live partition mobility, I'm stuck because I can't move a partition from one machine to another if it owns any hardware. Further, doing redundancy with SRIOV required that you did things like um, virtual uh, IPs because you, you couldn't, there was no way for VIO server even to virtualize that thing in a way that you could that you could load balance it. Along comes VNIC or virtual NIC. And so what VNIC does is allows a slice of an SRV adapter attached to each of your two VIO servers and then shared up to the guest partition. So it's kind of cool. Um, it's not perfect yet. There are a couple of glitches with it, one of which is if it fails over from one VIO to another, the Ethernet line actually fails and comes back, it comes back immediately, but um, there is a nasty message that says, oh, your Ethernet line failed. Oh, it's back. Oh, okay, good. Um, so it doesn't really affect anything in the sense that nobody loses connectivity, but it, it's not as smooth yet as the SEA, for example, um, which fails. I mean, you don't even ever see it. Right? Absolutely. And, and if live partition mobility is your thing, then you're going to be going down the virus route for, you know, for different reasons, just to enable that. And, you know, that that's an excellent function. Great. Um, and you might now look at DB2 mirror as an alternative to that. But again, you may be looking at Vios for that reason. Yep. So VNIC, new thing. And no, IBM is not going to do it because you'll never do redundancy over there. Um, now, the SEA bridge redundancy... I, I'm kind of being kind to IBMI here by saying that really, because <laughs> it's really a no. Uh, um, I mean, yes, you could have, and I, don't, I have none. Uh, Brad, do you have anybody with two VIO, two IBMI servers functioning as hosts? Oh, I have one. Um, and I'll tell you the reason why they did that uh, is that they wanted to have um, redundant um, disconnections for all of their partitions. They're all relatively small, but they're very important. Okay. So we, we, we carved the, the host up in half, created two partitions, put half the storage on each, uh, and so then mirrored the disks on the, the client partitions. That way, yeah. if one of the hosts went offline, the machine, you know, for, for patching the, 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 the clients were still up. It's a bit janky uh, because of the way you have to resynchronize the storage yeah. afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, you're better using external storage um, to do that uh, kind sure. of thing. Sure. But I mean, that's that's kind of the only place that you could do this redundancy stuff. Yeah. And, um, and and even then, it's not truly redundant the way that VIO server does it with an SEA. You'd have to use load balancing uh, or virtual IPs uh, to make that work. Yeah. So Agreed. And there's a bit of an argument that comes back with that. So th there are some times when VIOS is technically superior. And if you need that 24-7 element of it and the things that enable that, then it might be worth that investment. Um, but you you would have to go a long way in both cost and training and skill resources to, to bridge that gap. So a lot will come down to what skills you've already got in house and what is the you know the uh, the requirement for keeping your machine up the whole darn time. Yep, exactly. So yep, so you know VIO wins this one um, uh, quite solidly and uh, is definitely the way to go. Yep. Um, IP routing well. Here's the thing. Could you use routing instead of bridging to get from your client partitions through the host and out into the network world? Well, the answer is you can, but why would you? Yeah, in fact, yeah, auditors will actually frown upon that um, because it can be seen as some sort of you know, hacking attack. So, you know, they really don't like operating systems that have any sort of data on them acting as routers or routers, um, uh, you know, in a network, um, because it really is very easy to impersonate somebody that's got better credentials than you if you allow that. So, you know, 
even though they both can, both of those is a yeses, um, I wish both of those were noes. Yeah, and you know, at least the default is off for both of them. Yeah, yeah. And um, and in an IBM I, you have to run a change network attribute to make it do that. So the default for that network network attribute is is no. Um, uh, it's called packet forwarding in that case, and and the default is no. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> tip, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been upgrading your machine since yeah. Late version two, early version four, you know, uh, check that that's off because you don't want it on. You really don't. Right. And and another thing that just is, is just kind of to point out is that IBM I might possibly be the most expensive router you could buy. Uh, well, only because Apple don't make one. <laughs> okay, there's that. <laughs> good, good call. All right. So let's look at the cost. Speaking of cost, yeah, that's a great lead in there. Um, operating system cost, right? So operating systems aren't free. Um, there was a time back in the past, some of you may recall that when you bought an i-series machine, it came with OS 400 on it for <clears throat> no additional charge. It wasn't free. Um, and that's the key. You have to understand the difference between free and no additional charge. IBM I today has a license per um, processor. And so if you're running IBM I as your host, then IBM I needs to be licensed. Uh, the price does vary by P group, as we all know, um, but you don't need a whole processor. Of course, that's gonna depend again on how many guest, process, guest partitions and how much work that thing needs to do in order to host your partition. So there is a cost potentially on the IBM I side. Uh, that there is, but also, you know, a lot of the uh, non-core IBM I, so IBM calls them LLPs, so things like your um, your development tools, uh, your uh, client access, your performance tools, um, your, um, I almost said web query, but that is charged by the core. So those ones, if you slice them up and have 0.1 of a core here, 0.2 of a core there, 0.5 of a core there, they're charged by the entire core. So you can get away with actually just buying them once and using them on five, six, seven machines if they're all sort of medium sized machines. And if they're not, um, if, they're mid if they're a bit bigger than that now, wait till Power 10 comes out. And by the time that sucker's there, you'll be able to run them as well on a single core. Yeah, you'll be back to that, exactly. And, and just, you know, from a, a standard perspective or thinking of best practice, I guess is the better term. On this host partition, typically, you're not gonna load very many of those licensed program products. Now, ideally, you have absolutely none, and I know that flies in the face of what people want, but the less software you've got on the host, the more efficient it's going to be both to run, but also to patch, and you want yes. to keep your patch times to a minimum. Exactly, and, and then because as part of a patching, there's backups, and um, there's some cool stuff we'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation there, but um, backing up less means less backup time. And, um, you know, so the one thing I will see sometimes is I will see um, on the host partition, I may see a, uh, the uh, SEU editor so that I can create a CL script for startup and shutdown kind of stuff. But you could also develop that on your development partition and copy it over there too. So agree with Brad there that you, you really want as little as possible on that hosting partition. And for very good reasons. And again, VIO, because it's part of Power VM that's licensed and most of you, I don't know about you, Brad, in our, our environment, we almost never deactivate cores. Uh, we do see some of our competitors deactivating cores, and I think it just sets you up for failure when you go, hey, yes, we can run Linux on our machine. Cool. Oh, wait, we deactivated all the cores. Yeah. I, you know, the, the, if you've got these enterprise machines, and so you're talking about P30 licensing, yeah, I, I get why that you don't want to have active cores that, um, that you're not using. That's fine. They cost big money. But mm -hmm. in the scale out world, um, where I spend most of my time, then then do I. Yeah, we're, we're talking about, you know, somewhere between uh, $50 and 50 pounds per core for the cost of it being there. It, it, it's, tr it's trivial, you save a tiny amount of money. Um, and so the, the amount that you are likely to save is infinitely outweighed the first time you call up anyone to try and activate any workload. The other thing we need you to remember is if you start using non rbmi workloads, so you want to play with Linux, for example, you want those cores and there's, you know, there's no charge for using them, then they're ready to go. Yep. 
Absolutely. And that's, and, and you want to set yourself up for that flexibility because what happens if the boss says, Hey, can we run, we've got this new opportunity. We can run Linux and, and we can run that on power. Great. Let's do that. And if you have to say, no, I'm sorry, but we deactivated those cores. Well, before you get to your next machine, um, that, that process now is well entrenched on some other hardware and you've lost that opportunity. Hey, and I'm not saying, by the way, that you would ever do this or, or that I would. But if you left a couple of extra cores active and you ever had that conversation with the boss that says, if I bought another core, how much faster would it be? Should we just try it for an hour and see what difference it makes to the month end? <laughs> turn the magic screwdriver and turn it down again. I mean, I, I'm just checking. There's no IBMers in the room, is there? No, no, none, none, no. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because way back in the day, my dad was a hardware repair guy. Started fixing computers in 1967. Holy. So um, back then, they data was on those rectangular cards, right, for the most part. But there were computers out there. And some of the guys that he worked with, he didn't work on mainframes, but some of the guys he worked on, uh, worked with, uh, did, and some competing mainframes. And there were some of those where they would bribe the maintenance guy to be on site during month end so that he could do certain things behind a hidden cover that would enable more processor <laughs> for a few hours. I mean, right. the term, the magic screwdriver, certainly over here in the UK, came about because an engineer would turn uh, could turn up and he would know which you know rear stats to change. And it would be like, oh, I've just turned the spin speed up on this. So they, they were artificially limited. <laughs> Yep, very true. And you talked about the Power Fives earlier, by the way, and the processor groups and uh, how some people call those the good old days when they were cheaper. Those older boxes, um, the reason why you didn't pay quite so much per core is because in hardware, they limited the cores. Do you remember CF Int? Do you remember that whole, we oh, have to do things in yes. batch versus interactive because it artificially oh. constrains the machine? Yep, oh. yep. When we moved on to these you know, Power 5 Plus and then Power 6 machines, that went away, and yes, you paid a little more for your license, but you got the full processing core. And in some cases, that was 10 times faster, 20 times more processing power than you had before. Yep. I, I have a friend who used to say, IBM ships these machines with a with a brick under the gas pedal, right? And you had to pay the money to, to shave the brick and yep. give you more, more of, the, of the gas pedal. And I mean, that is literally true up until Power 5. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I remember them ordering at that particular customer, they ordered the, the upgrade and it came with that thing that looked like a USB stick and you had to, to plug that thing in and it was like, what? <laughs> that's not a processor upgrade. No, it's an enabling feature. Yeah. But that's, that's been a standard in the computer industry forever. As I remember my father coming home and saying, I did an upgrade today. A customer went from a five megabyte disk to 10 megabytes i go really that must have been an interesting upgrade he says yes i i cut a wire <laughs> that was literally the upgrade <laughs> and he says i'm not sure how i feel about that is was that a good thing uh, you know because you know the customer had it all along they just weren't able to utilize it right um, of course in the manufacturing world we know that the they saved money by manufacturing basically one model but yeah so let's look at disk arms uh, required for our host uh, because it's got to live somewhere. And, and um, for those of you who uh, want to uh, pick nits, as we say over here in the colonies, um, disk arms or SSDs or NVMEs or whatever, all the same, just different velocities, if you will. Um, the default, of course, is for IBM I to live on some of the space that you're using for hosting. So if you have you know, a big pool of, of say 18 drives in the front of your machine and uh, whether they're spinning disk or SSDs, it doesn't matter. IBM I um, by default spreads itself over all of those disks. And so it's just going to use a little bit of that space, a little more on the load source. Yes. But otherwise a little bit, yep. um, you can, if you want, and I've definitely done this is we've set up IBM I to live on just maybe four disks mirrored and then make a big pool of disks that's for the hosting. We've done that too. And there's advantages either way because um, you, know, you can pick which, which type of media, is it you know, faster, slower, whatever. Um, and then you know, those hosted disks, like I say, could be in, an, in a regular ASP or an independent ASP, um, your call. 
And um, some of you might be going, well, if it's an independent ASP, could I use Power HA and mirror the whole? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, you can play all kinds of games and, and of course, SAN replication as well. So, um, but this is where it starts to get ugly for VIO. Yeah. Because I've done it. I've taken VIO server. I've, I've, I've raided all the disks in my keck. And then I've installed VIO server on that RAID set. You can do this. That's not recommended. It's really not recommended. Um, they really want you to use two drives, right? Boot from those, mirror them, and then use other storage. But that, that uses up slots, right? Yeah, and we, and we sort of talked about this whole MPIV thing earlier, and this is where it comes to it, its own. A lot of purists will say, really, what we want to do is just have, you know, uh, two pairs of disks in the system unit, and those are each run a, a VIOS and then boot in a, in a pair. They can be super slow disks as VIOS is not at all IO intensive. It's all done in memory, fine. Um, and what VIOS is very poor at is IO. It, it's not optimized for IO. It's optimized to allow IO to happen. It's optimized to allow networking to happen. And that's why they like you to actually have the storage element separate from VIOS so that you know, it can sit there and from, you know, from memory conduct the orchestra. It doesn't play instruments at all well. So you know, I, I don't mind the whole um, you can boot from SAN argument. The, the problem I have is, isn't the SAN, that's getting less expensive. Uh, the ports, however, in the fiber cards are ever more precious. So if I boot from SAN, I've got to really dedicate at least two of those precious ports that could have been serving literally a dozen partitions and saying, okay, you're purely there just to get this very slow operating system into memory. That, that just is not a good use of money. Um, so, you know, those cards can, those fiber cards can literally be 10 times the price uh, of a pair of discs, 20 times the price of the, an individual spinning disc. So you, you, yeah. you just don't want to do that. Yeah. Go, go look up the price of a 32 gig um, SFP um, and, yeah, yeah. Or, or an eight port switch upgrade for your, for your <laughs> fiber switch. <laughs> yeah. We're talking, yeah, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, yeah, it's I've, it's I've just pointless. cars for less than that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> That doesn't mean that, you know, that VIOS can't perform really high performing um, environments. You know, you can have incredibly fast performing IO coming from VIOS just as you can from IBM I, but you design it differently and you really are using a, a SAN at that point, regardless of whether that SAN is, is made up of, you know, NVMEs or uh, FCM cards or you know, SSDs. You, you design that separately, but you would use VIOS in that regard. The IBM I part um, is, is one of the things we always run back to with IBM I is if you want IBM I to run faster, give it more RAM. Um, yes. And so if, if you want to give it the equivalent of an L4 cache boost or an L5 cache boost these days, just max out the RAM in that machine. And whether it's acting as a host or as a client, it will run faster, unbelievably faster. Oh yeah, and, and that's the benefit of that single level storage, right? You, you give it more memory, It'll have more stuff in said memory. It just will. So, and we're yep. going to talk more about disk yep. uh, upcoming when we get into uh, um, get past this next thing. We're going to call knowledge level, and 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 we've been mentioning this kind of as we go through. So, this is kind of to focus that. So, knowledge level needed. If I'm an IBM I shop already and I want to virtualize, what do I need to learn to host? with IBM I? Well, it's really pretty minimal. I mean, a couple of commands, right? Work NWS storage, work NWS description, right? And that's mostly what you're going to need to learn in IBM I. Yeah, okay, create networks, uh, create Ethernet, create line ETH with the bridge parameter. Got to do that one. Right. Yeah, and if you want to get into actually um, doing network installations, there's those five commands I mentioned earlier yep. before. Yep. But most people who are doing this is the, the truth is they want a second partition for their development environment. Yes. They want a second partition for their valuable data. Yep. Um, you know, they want to test an upgrade to make sure it actually works. Yes, uh, and um, you know, if we're talking to those people right now then the left hand bar, you know, it, it couldn't be any further across. It really just slided into the wall. 
Um, but, you know, if you are looking for something that is truly scalable and you've got just as many Unix people and Linux people as you do IBM I people, then, okay, that, that, that slider needs to be more in the middle, you know? Yep. And, and it's a, um, the phrase I like to use is once you go LPAR, you never go back. Right? <laughs> once, because once you've created that test LPAR, you need to, and then you need one for developers and you need one for QA. And, and it's not just a, uh, a random thing. It, it, they really are valuable. And the auditors love them, by the way, you know, you're testing on a non-production partition. This is good, right? Now, when we talk about disk support, and this is one of those things, you know, way back in the day, I used to have communication lines coming out of the back of my system 36, right? And we paid a company called AT&T. They may have even been in the UK. I don't know. Well, but, they made the Death Star. It was over all of us. It was even over Tatooine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we had AT&T. Well, guess who I got my modems from? I got them from AT&T. Why? Because that way, when they complained and said, well, it's not the line, it's your modem, I could say, and what are you doing about that? <laughs> right. And so when you deal with IBM I, right, you've got really, really good technicians on that and, and, and some very strong people. But now when they say, well, we're going to blame the SAN, I go, great, let me just look at the front of my SAN a minute. Oh, it says IBM I on it. Good. That's you guys too. But it's a different group within IBM, right? They're not made in the same building. And um, early on, the IBM I folks in the SAN support was kind of, and, and, and Brad used the word earlier, janky. I like that word. Yeah. Uh, because if, if you were on Power 5 and you tried to boot from SAN, um, there was only like one SAN, I think, the DS8000. And you had to have this special IOP card. And it was a lot of goofy stuff. Um, and I would like to say that DS8000 cost the same as my house. Just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. And we talked to a customer not very long ago, still running DS8000. Yeah. And I'm like, oh man. Oof. Um, but the, you know, it's gotten way, way, way better uh, on the IBM I side. Um, the, probably the single most important thing, and if Dawn May's listening, she's going to be nodding her head going, the, the, the gathering performance data within IBM I, if the disk is on SAN, is nearly nothing. You can, you can see the performance numbers, but you can't see through to the SAN to know why, right? So we can see the response time of a, of a virtual disk, but we don't know why, we have, we have no visibility there. That's probably the biggest thing at this point. Um, but when you deal with the VIO side, right? IBM I had so, and here's the thing, I'm gonna slide the side. IBM I did internal disk since when? Day one. Absolutely, so, since God was allowed. Yeah. Minus days because the system 38 had it, right? And so even way back when we first got RAID, we had the ability to add disks to RAID on the fly. And people would say, you can't do that. Yes, we can. And we had all this ability to move data around between disks and add disks. And, and all of that's gotten better and better and better and better. So as a consequence of having that capability and being very good at it, we kind of looked at SAN support and said, why would I do that? I can do all those things. I can do it better or at least as good. And I know how important thing. Whereas the AIX guys didn't have anywhere near that capability. Sure, they could make rate sets and they could make you know uh, volume groups and all those things, but didn't have the capability. So when SANS came out, they went, ooh, yeah, let's offload that to the SAN guys. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. So they were way ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. On I mean, I, I mentioned that single level storage issue before. So SANS actually could theoretically slow a machine down if they weren't configured properly, even though the storage was faster because you've mm -hmm. got the single level storage algorithm fighting the SAN algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. They both think that they know better. And, you know, as, as a European, uh, we, we have neighbors who, who think they know better than us. Um, and to be honest, most of them do. Uh, but that whole idea of, uh, of you have to work collaboratively in, in the same sort of way, or it slows everything down, is just like trying to move things across borders between countries. If yes. you don't have the same system, even though theoretically you can drive at 70 miles an hour, not while you're filling in that paperwork, you can't. Right. And, and, you know, here in the U S we had that problem in, uh, I'm in Michigan, United States. And, um, one of our biggest neighbors is the entire country of Canada. 
Yeah. We had a little trucker blockade over there um, that was blocking the border because uh, between Michigan and Canada, there was a nice lake. And so the number of crossing points is, is very limited. In fact, it's primarily two. And uh, when you block half of that, you uh, you really screw up the cross border thing. So yeah, it, it is a it is a matter of of you know both sides have to be cooperating because we were over on our side going yo send us your trash send us your trash oh, well and they do it's a big import from Canada is their garbage but auto parts <laughs> you're, you're kidding me I, I no. thought the Canadians were so clean that they they didn't make trash it, the the thing that's so bizarre about it is you know here we are in 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 we call it the mitten right <laughs> For those of you that don't know Michigan right the mitten there it is it's where i live and and oh there's this thing up here that the up right um and so those of us that live in the mitten we live below the bridge so we're trolls okay. <laughs> that explains so much yeah. even the beard yeah yeah it's why i'm so short <laughs> oh wait okay there's some, some yeah that, that only works on zoom yeah ladies and yeah. gentlemen <laughs> the man right. has legs that's right but you know, the, oddly enough, here we are surrounded by Great Lakes, and we get a tremendous amount of trash imported uh, to landfills within Michigan from Canada, which is, it just kind of seems odd, you know. Um, but, you know, to get back a little bit on track here. Um, Apologies. Because they do so much sand support in the AIX and Linux uh, world, right, those AIX guys have always done sand support, and it's, and it's very good. It's very good, and and we'll touch more on NPIV, which is an, uh, a thing in a, in a in a minute. Now, when you deal with those internal disks, right? When I've had IBM literally tell me, "Oh, you got this message? Oh, it was probably followed by this one. Oh, yeah, and then this one. Uh huh, and then that one. Yes." Have you been looking at my system? No, that's the standard thing. And what it means is you got to do this. Oh, cool, right? Because they've done it for so long and it's so well documented and you know it keeps growing, yes. And they add things like NVMe, but all in, it's been there forever. There's no mystery left. Yeah, you don't have the exponentiality of, of having all different hardware vendors in there. And yeah. what do I mean by that? I mean, you if, if you start going up that whole uh, multiply by two, multiply by two, those factors and those powers, you know, two, four, six, eight, they're all quite small numbers. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, as it starts, when you start doubling up in the thousands of combinations uh, and you're trying to equate for all of those, that's a, a lot of problem determination. And it's the reason why I think Apple is so successful. It's emulating a lot of what IBM did in the early days, it controls the entire stack. So in IBM uh, world, now we've got the operating system, they, you know, they know the hardware and they also own all the adapters and all the storage sitting behind them. And you may moan and say, well, there's only a subset of the world's storage I can use. Yes, but it's really well document documented. It's been thoroughly tested and it's been tuned and optimized. You know, I know of a number of adapters that the only reason they're not in use is because IBM said, yeah, it works. It works reliably, but it's not fast enough. And the same with disk arms. Yeah, well, well, when, when they eventually source out the firmware so it runs at full speed, we'll have it. And they can choose not to do that before then. Exactly, exactly. And they also own all the drivers and they update the drivers and all of that, right? So there's no, um, oh, uh, so you're running a card on a driver from four years ago? No. It's, it's not a thing because it's all in there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so much of it actually gets updated at the same time when you're doing that one PTF patching install. Not always, okay. but so if, if you've got a SAN, then there is some big advantages, uh, particularly if you've got lots of machines and particularly if you want to actually run different workloads on there. So you're a medium sized shop and you've got VMware as well as your own Linux, as well as your own IBM. I. Yeah, you can put them all on the same SAN and you can actually set up you know, replication groups. So that entire SAN takes your storage off line synchronously and backs it up to another SAN. There are advantages. There really are. And those aren't all down to, you know, Vios. Uh, some of them are just down to, you know, the, the SAN, which can be natively attached. But yeah, you, it's, it's worth considering. But if you're a typical small to medium sized shop and you're looking at a new machine at the moment with those MVMEs, wow, it's a, it's a compelling argument to use the internal storage and it's a compelling argument to have iHosting I at that point. Yeah. 
So let's look at uh, maintenance. We did we did mention the the thing about drivers, and we'll touch on that here in in, in this section as well. But you know, you got call home support, and um, you know, I remember some of the early days of call home. I was actually at a customer site, and and the the secretary of IT had a secretary at the time. She came over to the guy I was working with and says, "Randy, there's a gentleman from IBM on the phone," and we're like, "Really?" Um, he said, "I'll take that call." And it was IBM calling to say, you know, you have a disk that's going to fail. How, how did you know that? And meanwhile, we're trying to figure out why we can't send payroll information to the bank because the modem was somehow in use, right? Well, it was calling home, right? And so that's been there. And, uh, you know, the paint on that machine was white, as we like to say. So that tells you how old that, that, that's that been around. Yep. And, you know, uh, whereas when you're dealing with, BIO, you're limited to the HMC really to, to do that call home. That's true. And even the HMC doesn't know about what's going on on the SAN, you know? Um, so, yeah, no. pa Power Nine just last week, uh, I'm, I'm sat there at a customer site and, and I get a call from IBM and saying, Can you apply these PTFs, please? Why? I said, Well, one of your SAS adapters has now started to reach a tolerance where it doesn't like this particular thing. And I thought, oh, how how dare you? And then I looked at the PTF levels on that adapter, uh, so the firmware on that adapter and the PTF level on the machine, I thought, yeah, okay. I, I'm not gonna criticize IBM. Thank you very much for, making, for, for letting me know. Yeah. That was a straight call home. No yeah. HMC on that box. That was just the IBM I service tools making a call back because things, nothing had failed. They just weren't working as well as they should have done. Exactly. And, and that's what a lot of those are when it when a service director downloads PTFs for you and says, you know, these things, you really want these. Yeah. And there have been times in the past where, you know, the really want part was, you know, need them immediately hint hint kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, so big, big advantage to IBMI and that now service tools. Um, this is another one in my book that in IBM I, the whole service tools environment, it is, I call it a different environment. You can really get in there and um, that's where you work with disk and you, you find uh, hardware problems, resolve various hardware problems. Um, you can have different levels of security in there. You can create as many user profiles as you want in there. Um, it, and it's, it's been there and it's been solid for, for 20 plus years. Um, there's really nothing to compare that to. I mean, Smitty, maybe? Um, well, I, you know, this is the first time I'm going to really take um, a, a viewpoint. Now, now, let's assume that we're using MPIV and VIOS. So actually, it's not VIOS I'm talking about here. It's actually, you know, the store-wise Spectrum virtualized management interface yep. for the disks. I think there's a compelling argument that you could say, well, even if you, regardless of whether you had um, VIOS or not, uh, if you're using SAN-based disks with MPIV, so there's a one-to-one -one relationship with the disks that you've created or they're being presented, there's a really nice way of actually um, managing, monitoring, duplicating, snapshotting storage in the in the eye. Now, I'm, you know, in that and that one actually is probably more intuitive than SST, but I don't I don't decry the fact that SST is incredibly powerful. But in an ironic kind of way, it's a bit more viosy if you start getting into the flight recorder and, and, and that yeah. area. You yeah, know, that's sort of, <laughs> um, so, yeah, with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I suppose in either of those, you have to know what you're doing because you really can take the machine offline if you start removing storage from a working machine. Yes, uh, yeah. no, no question there. there. There are mistakes that can be made in, in, in both environments. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in my book, the, the, the greatest advantage to service tools is the fact that it is, you know, separately secured and, you know, it, you have your own user IDs, you have your own passwords, and they're not the same as your IBMI user IDs and passwords, or at least they shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, and um, whereas in, in um, BIOS, it's, you know, really OEM setup environment. Smith, all right, let's go at it. Oh yeah, and I, I, yeah, you tell tell me about it. How many people create multiple logins for VIOS? Yeah, you know, right. How many people get actually change the admin password? You know, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so don't, don't even start me on that. And to go into that OEM environment, it isn't like anywhere else where you need a second level um, password to actually accelerate to um, 
to uh, bring on the higher level of privileges. Uh, no, no, it, ju it just happens by default. Yeah, it's not uh, like super user in Linux. You don't even no, have that. No pseudo at all. And, and to be fair to the point you were making earlier about debugging, I look at that word again, there is some better flight recording information in SST than over on the other side. So, you know, swings, swings and roundabouts. Yep. And if you look at the fix application process, and, you know, I just went through this again on upgraded some VIO partitions over the weekend. Um, when you're doing IBMI, um, you know, the PTF process, it's so well known. It's, it's so simple that even I teach classes on how to do PTFs. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's very well documented. It is easy to do it remotely. Um, and, you know, many, many problems IBM's already identified and, and, you know, pr providing those fixes in the various groups, right? If you don't know what a hyper group is, if you don't know what a QM is and those kinds of things, you gotta, you gotta learn that stuff, but it's not hard. And it's really just, you know, classified groups uh, uh, within of the PTS. But when you deal with VIO, um, I mean, literally that was a valid version number, 2.1.1.4 space SP25-SPO2. Yeah. Really? Um, holy cow. It is on IBM I. It's like 7.3 and I have QM level this, you know, technology release this, right? Nice, neat box of, of numbers. Um, and then the process can be really janky too, um, because if you get an ISO, it's not doesn't make it easy to install the fixes. No, and indeed the rollback is to actually scrap that VIOS and reinstall it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, it, which the first time you hear that is, uh, do what now? <laughs> you want me to do what with what? Um, no, 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 we're going to fix this. Oh, no, 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 sir. Uh, what you're going to do is just scrap that. But, you know, I've got my working system above this. And yeah. It's running a bank. Yeah. <laughs> it, it goes to a, that line from Top Gun. You're going to do what? <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it, the process just just not as nice and not as smooth with, without doubt. Um, and... Um, and then when you look at device driver installation, right? Um, what what's a device driver? I mean, IBM I comes with a mall built in, yep. so done. Now the good news is most of the drivers in VIO are also included. Um, it's pretty rare to actually have to install a driver. There are some situations where you do, um, oh, you need to obtain this, uh, but that's pretty rare now. I haven't run into that in eh, probably several years. Um, yeah, so and if you're keeping that virus up to date, typically they start to build those into those updates that we were talking about. So, yeah, yeah as yeah, day and date new new adapters come along, great, get your virus upgraded beforehand, and then you'll be able to embrace them come the time. Yeah. So drivers good, but firmware not so much. No, no. Right. So firmware, you get PTFs, and when you load the PTFs, um, there's a phase in that IPO where those those firmware fixes are downloaded into your adapters. This is goodness, but oh my goodness. Um, I, and this is actually a quote. You'll notice the quote marks in the green there, and I'm not gonna read that, but that's actually out of IBM's documentation, right? That you need to do this. And you know, the good news is it has gotten easier and there's definitely, I mean, even through the HMC now, you can go in and poke and it'll tell you, Oh, all these adapters are current. And these adapters are not current, which is way easier than it used to be. Because it used to be, what is it, LSFW list firmware? Um, and then, you know, okay, now I know what it is, but now I got to go to IBM's website and I got to go poke what's the current firmware. So, um, yeah, yeah. And it, it got a little bit difficult sometimes when you, you were thinking, okay, what level? Because when you've just got that firmware, you know, uh, is that compatible with the version of the operating system I've got on it? Does it go on first? Does it go on afterwards? It can be a little terrifying. And there's, there's more plates that you're spinning on that side for sure. Yeah. Um, but it does give you that granularity that if you need to have an environment where these adapters are at a certain firmware level because the, the, the janky version of Linux on the other side only works with that version, you yeah. can hold them at that level. Uh, whereas the you know, the IBM I ones, if you're if you're doing that, you know they, those firmware is going to come down. But equally, IBM should be presenting virtual adapters that that, that deal with that. So there is definitely a sharper scalpel 
over on the, the Vios side. Um, but I think most mortals would rather it wasn't a scalpel at all and that they just had a, you know, a butter knife to butter their crumpets. Exactly. <laughs> now, when you look at the security of the host, I think everybody will understand that, you know, first off, we have to make the disclaimer that just because IBM I is securable doesn't mean you secured it right. And most of you didn't, by the way. Um, but it is securable. And you can easily create a new profile for each admin, and you should. Yep. Right? Um, you should not be signing on to your host partition as QSEC offer any more than you should sign on with your other partitions as QSEC offer. Um, that much is true. When you go at AIX, though, and, and Brad mentioned this earlier, uh, VIO, you know, how many have created a profile other than P admin? And I actually tried at one point, and I tried to get the stupid thing to work, and I couldn't get it to work. And I said, okay. fine. I'm just going to leave P admin then and, and, yeah. um, you know, just not let other people in. <laughs> yeah, you can have other users just so you can enable P admin when you need to do maintenance work. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's it. You try auditing what you're doing as well as do who you let in and when in, in BIOS. And of course, in IBM, I, you do have full auditing even on the host as well as the clients. Uh, so yes, yeah. that, that is a very, very good point too, is, uh, auditing on IBM I is very good. And, um, you know, one of the things, in fact, auditing can be one of my favorite things within IBMI because I sell disk. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I hear you. Absolutely. So let's look at save and restore. And we're talking about the host partition again, save and restore of the host partition. Um, we know that on IBMI, we can do a go save and take an option 21. And, and I think, you know, this has been, somebody once told me IBM was going to renumber that menu. And I said, no because there'll, there'll be a storm on Fortress Rochester, right? I mean, it, it can't, it can't do it. 21 is a save and a full save. Yeah. And, and you can save less than that. You can do a save 22. You can do um, other, other uh, subcomponents. And it's very easy to understand how to do backups because we've done backups in IBMI forever. And so we know what we're doing. And, um, one of the interesting things is, you know, did you know you can do a save 22, even a save 21 while the host partition is active, you can do a save of the host partition. Okay. So caveat time, <laughs> uh -huh. but yeah, so, uh, uh, let, let's avoid the 21 people, uh, cause there's, there's a difference between possible and sensible. Um, but because uh, one of the, the, the default parameters that the, the Save21 will do is literally vary off all of the network storage controllers, which are then running all your other disks. Um, right. And if you don't vary them off, then the backup does run. But it, in my experience, doesn't complete normally, even though you've actually you know, got all the data. It, it doesn't mark it as completed normally because it couldn't grab those things. Yeah, and it, um, can't, it can't back up the network server description or the network server storage. Yep because those guys are in use. Okay, fair enough. So so the disclaimer is absolutely valid, right? Yes, you can do a save 21 while the thing's running, but what are you backing up? You're not backing up your guests. And that's the important thing. Understand that. And by the way, from a DR point of view, if again, if, if you've only got one or two guest partitions and you want to have a single um dr recovery image with the host and all the clients you get that with that save 21 the yep. default will run and it will back up all of the configuration of the guests and the images of the storage of the guest as well yep. uh, and i've got people who love that from a whole dr point of view particularly if they're using virtual tape because those backups are very very fast yep exactly and it is and i even remember back during one of the one of the um hurricanes here in the United States, the hurricane was a common. And there was a customer that had said, Oh, okay, they shut down all their hosted stuff, which at the time even included windows, they did a save 21 of that host partition, and they ran out of town. And they went to a recovery center, and they were able to recover everything from a single tape. And that's, you know, if you could, if you got time, and typically with a hurricane, they give you some pretty good warning. Um, so, uh, you know this better than anyone. You, the, the, with the VTLs you have these days, if you've put one of those in, yes, you'll do that. You'll snap it to a VTL. It'll be much faster than that physical tape. And it'll then start immediately sending the copy of the backup image out to the other set, the data center. Yes. So 
you know, there's no drive in, there's um, less downtime. And, you know, there's, there's no drive to the other data center. By the time you got to the other data center, the data would be there and ready to use. You do it all from the comfort of hopefully somewhere without the storm. Exactly. And, and this is, this is one of the big, big benefits these days of the VTLs. No, no question about it. Yeah. Um, we've been using VTLs in our data center for quite a while and, and just, they just keep getting better and better. Um, and the, the, to contrast that the backups of VIOS are, well, I mean, the VIOS environment itself, easy to back up, right? The config of it, yeah. but the whole partition, not so much, right? That, that thing is um, um, very complicated. And because it's all those AIX things. Yeah. And if you're using MPIV, as a lot of people are, a lot of the configuration is outside of via Earth VIOS. That the whole thing about MPIV, that virtualization pass through elements of it, right, is it means that the configuration of the storage is in the storage device. It's in the SAN. There is no way that VIOS can back it up. So you have to be mindful of that and replicate that configuration separately. That said, there are some advanced features that nobody uses. Did you know you could snapshot IBM I while it was in use? Um, you know, theoretically, you absolutely can with VIOS. Um, yes. Single level storage says that's probably a very bad idea because some of the, the key data is actually in RAM, not on the disks that you snapshot in, but you know, you can do it. You can um, do it. Indeed. Um, so, you know, um, horses for courses. VIOS, again, it, it wins if you're trying to do a consolidated backup environment for lots of different operating systems. Um, if it's a simpler environment and you want to snap everything on a single bootable recoverable image, IBM I wins, uh, you know, but you need more downtime to do the work. Yep. And then, and then, you know, taking another step forward, then we're talking about saving those client disks. And as, as Brad mentioned earlier, the whole, you know, saving of those disks doesn't work if that client is active, but if you shut the client down, then I can save those images. And, um, you know, and, and one of the nice things about the way that it's architected now is that no matter what ASP they're in, the images appear to be in, in that QFP NWS STG um, directory uh, and, then, and then under there. So um, that part is nice. Yeah, and, and a pro tip, if you might, don't mind from the other side of that, if you have just got a test partition uh, with data you don't particularly care about, uh, do remember to actually set the attribute of those disks in the QFP student storage directory not to be backed up when you're doing your save 21 of the production system because you'll make your save 21 faster of your production environment and you'll make your DR faster if you have to use it. Yes. Yep. That is a good, good, a very good tip. And um, that tip can apply, by the way, to image catalogs as well. If you have some big image catalogs out there that. Yeah. Bravo. Uh, Ab absolutely. Back yep. PTFs, for example, um, set, set that. Um, so if we look, you know, the full save, and we've, we've kind of covered this really, but a full save can, in fact, on IBMI include all those hosts, but of course requires the guests to be buried off. So yep. we, we really, but yeah, it does a really great DR backup in that environment. Absolutely. And uh, everyone thinks it's going to affect the networking, but it really doesn't. So no, that's kind of, yeah, because all the networking um, stuff is actually done in the, in the license internal code. So yeah, there's, there's no IBMI involved there. Now, sharing tape through the host, and this is a thing that um, there's a fair, a, a fair bit of difference here. First off, IBMI used to only share tape drives, right? And then with, uh, I forget which one of the TRs, but it's in both 7.3 and 7.4, um, you can now share libraries that are attached to the host. You can share the library through to the guest now in IBMI. And that's really, really cool. Because now if I have two tape libraries and they're hooked up to the same card, I don't need to move the card anymore between partitions. I can leave it hooked to the host and I can just vary on, vary off the ones I need to use. So very cool there. And it's very similar. And the same caveat applies resource, not device. Right? You're sharing a resource. In VIO, you're manually mapping it um, to the client. And that is, again, if the drive is not NPIV attached. NPIV is a different game. Yep. All right. Um, and that the device, so in other words, in VIO, it's really only SAS attached. 
that's really all that's uh, all that's there. We used to have SCSI back in the day, but those are all gone. But hey, SAS is really SCSI, right? Um, sort of. Well, it's um, the, yeah, it's, it's the, um, the the last S in SAS, I suppose. You know, serial yes. attached SCSI, technically. Um, yeah. Yep. It's kind of like you know, we we said that we got rid of um, serial ports on our PCs. No, we didn't. We just call them USB now. <laughs> um, but the um, um, the the glitch with um, um, the SAS again is I'm mapping and unmapping that thing within VIO. Okay, so and if it's fiber attached, I can't even do that. I have to use NPIV, um, which I would want to do. I am not saying bad things about NPIV, by the way, because um, it is the way to go with fiber for sure. Uh, because the singular advantage to NPIV shared tape drives or tape libraries, importantly, is it can be varied on on multiple partitions at the same time, even all of them. And it's just a matter of how many drives are in there as to how many people can be back. Yeah, restoring. and as you know, because of that technology and the way it's working, you know, it is emulating you know dedicated fiber channel adapters. You do get a higher maximum throughput so if if backup time was optimal but it be it physical or virtual table tape libraries uh if that really was the be all and end all of how long you, uh, of, of your design then you probably would be at least looking at attaching your storage uh, your network your backup via the vios route yeah yep. it's okay on ibmi but yep. it's not as fast as it uh, as it is uh, in that other environment yep all right, so now let's get into SAN support a little bit. And, um, you know, one of the first pieces there is, you know, can I share SAN storage that's attached to IBMI as a host? Well, yes, but it kind of comes down to a why would you? Because once you have a SAN, um, then why wouldn't you virtualize the SAN through VIO mostly? And, um, you know, so for the most part, the recommendation is, don't do it. You end up doing, you know, IBM I then has to do the read of that SAN data and then present it as NP or as virtual SCSI back to the host or to the client, I'm sorry. So just, just not the right way to go. Um, versus VIO, one of the things that shines it. Uh, yeah, I literally built from the ground up in order to do that. Um, now, you know, these days, if, if you did just have, you know, one SAN direct attached, then we're not saying you shouldn't uh, attach some of that storage and create the secondary partition and you don't have to introduce the VIOS to do it. But, um, you know, we went, we talked a little earlier about how VIOS was built for integration with SANs. Well, this is an extension of that piece. You know, VIOS was built for integration with SANs, so it, it does do it very well. And its maximum throughput, in my experience, is faster, you know, when done via VIOS. But these SANs are so fast now that usually the bottleneck is is not the SAN. Uh, yeah, usually the, right. the bottleneck is not the workload. There's usually something in the middle that's slowing it down. And, and part and parcel to that whole SAN support is this thing, this NPIV support. And, you know, in some ways, uh, NPIV is a little bit like uh, VLANs within the SAN. Right, I got these packets of data coming from the SAN destined to a WWN that VIOS knows about, and that's a specific IBMI guest or Linux guest or AIX guest. Right, so those packets get di directed to the correct guest partition, and therefore I'm sharing a single fiber path to do multiple uh, multiple guest partitions. So, um, yeah, number one reason why people use VIOS is the need for MPIV. Uh, and and uh, whilst uh, Larry described it very eloquently earlier, just as a simpleton, that, that, that MPIV allows you to break the, re the relationship between the number of virtual fiber channel adapters and the number of physical uh, cards and ports that you have. Uh, because those cards are so fast, you can literally have uh, one card pretending to be many cards okay and that's that's this that's the virtualization element of it exactly and as you look forward i mean when the very first adapters that we put in fiber on an as 400 were i think uh two gigabit uh fiber 
And, and today you're, you're, you're getting 32 gigabit fiber adapters. And multiple ones of them that you yeah. then aggregate together. You know. Exactly. And, you know, up to four ports each. And then, you know, and so the actual velocity and, and it's been kind of a bottleneck for a while because the, the traffic going across that, sand, that, that fiber channel is really scuzzy. And so there was a lot of work done to build up this SCSI command so you could send it across this fiber really fast. And then the guy on the other end had to un unwind it all because the guy on the other end is not what? NVMe. <laughs> he doesn't care about SCSI. He's got a block of data someplace that you want. So as those protocols are improved, we're going to start seeing even better throughput because now we're going to be able to leverage that 32 gig um, interface, which today you got to have a really big machine to get anywhere close to even significant traffic on a 32 gig port yeah and that mpiv is built to scale as well and we'll be seeing 64 bit and 128 bit cards with multiple ports on so the future as we start to extend you know memory buses between machines you can yep. see that working in it down this line yep yeah there's already uh some providers are manufacturing 128 gig fiber ports now, I don't know what they cost because a uh, 32 gig port is a lot of money <laughs> already. Yeah. Um, but it's it's coming, right? And it'll be it'll be leveraged when we when we get some of that. Well, the good news, the 32s will go down in price. I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and and just a note here that NPIV is absolutely needed if you're gonna do mobility. So if I have a partition running on this machine and now I want to run it on this machine, that's that mobility, you have to have NPIV to do that. Right. Unless, all right, let's be careful. You can shut it completely down over here and then configure these WWNs on the SAN and bring it up over here. That's legal. But if you want to do it live, right, which is the, the, the cool bits, it has to be using NPIV. Yeah. And, and so a lot of people don't realize this exists. So we probably just should spell that out. If anyone hasn't heard of this live partition mobility or didn't quite know what it meant, it really is like vMotion in the VMware world. This idea of I am going to move this working, running, people logged in, doing their banking transactions from piece of hardware A to piece of hardware B without them realizing it. It moves between hosts. Uh, and if that sounds appealing to you and you're not doing it, then you're going to be wanting Vios and you should be doing some reading right now. That's right. Exactly. And it is, it is very cool. Restrictions apply. One of which is you have to be using NPIV for your disk support. Yes, sir. Um, now this one we've kind of touched on, but can I have my host installed on the SAN? Well, we certainly mentioned that with VIO. Yes, you can. Um, and with IBMI, yes, you can absolutely install and boot IBMI from a SAN these days. We do it all the time, right? So um, it's it's really kind of an even thing, although, um, and the whole thing about more SANs is kind of going away because it used to be there were a lot more SANs that, that um, AIX would work with and thus VIO would work with. Today, it's pretty much every major SAN that, I don't even know, does IBM sell a SAN anymore that IBMI can't use? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not, not anymore, right? We mentioned that old DS8000. That was one that was kind of a um, an odd duck. But there was the whole DS storage family that, for the most part, a IBM I didn't didn't work with those. That's correct. And, and to be fair, that wasn't there. That was a rebadged IBM product. You know, since we've been running, you know, with the whole. Um, flash systems and before uh, I'm, I'm being told not not to use the storeways term anymore because you know when i say storeways to uh, storage people they go well you told me not to say i series or as 400 hang on, i'm sorry okay yeah. so flash <laughs> systems oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they've got a point right so yeah. i if you go out there and i, I bought myself a 5200 the the other week because I, I hadn't got one and it was very nice and that ibm i just worked out of the box yeah yep. and it was fast yeah Oh, hell yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you look at the disk support and what we're talking about specifically here is some of the disks internally. Um, we mentioned this one a little bit. So um, this is kind of a duplicate slide. So we'll go over it really, really quickly. It's just a matter of where does the host live versus where do the guests live on that internal disk, right? And so for IBMI, you know, you can, you can just make it one ASP and use it 
shared between both, um, or you can break it up. With VIO, it's two drives mirrored for VIO and then any other storage that you want to use um, to host the partition. And while this is rare, I just installed a Power9 just a few weeks ago with VIO, single VIO with internal disk. And you know that's the environment the customer wanted. It, it, it is out there. Um, boot from SAN supported. Yep, um, we already talked about that. Um, can I extend the host operating system disk? Well, this is IBMI's again. One of those things IBMI does very well. Yep. Yeah. Stick in more disk. Add it to the OS. Let the and, system. And yeah. Not only does it add it, it then optimizes for it as well. Yep. And, and if you want to swap out a bunch of disk, we're doing that uh, for a customer with an IBMI host um, next month. We have it on the schedule. Um, we're going to go in there. We're going to hook a drawer up that's got all SSDs in. We'll migrate all the storage to those SSDs, and then we'll put the SSDs inside the, the system unit, you know, for golden, right? Um, whereas when you look at AIX, um, yeah, there's reboots in there, and there's root VG copying, and, and it's really a pain in the butt to change. And it goes back to the whole IBMI has been doing internal disk for so long and so well, whereas the AIX guys went, yeah. SAN guys, are you ready? Can we, can we hand that off to you? <laughs> and to be fair, if you do hand it off to the SAN guys, this is what I would, uh, one of the few times I would disagree, I'd drag that more to the middle. Because if you're using MPIV or direct attached um, you know, SAN storage, you can um, then uh, add more volumes and present more volumes and move the storage from one sand to another without downtime. Yeah, you know, that is all there. Yeah, resizing volumes, not so much. You can do it, but IBMI doesn't like it when you do it. But yeah. actually adding more volumes, yeah. I think to to be fair, if if we're using um, modern VIOS with MPIV, MPIV, that slider should be more towards the middle. Yeah. Okay, certainly doesn't... with, with SAN, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, if you look at support, right? So when the, we're migrating disk, or so this is internal disk, right? So we've got, um, if you have AIX or a VIO server running on internal disks versus SAN, IBMI on internal disk versus SAN, um, moving clients between ASPs, for example, yeah, that takes an outage because you've got to shut them down to, to do that. But I can move disks between the ASPs. I could take disk out of the system ASP and move it into a system, an independent ASP. I can do that on the fly, right? Um, where, whereas with VIO server, I got to shut things down um, because the, the way that that internal disk support is, it's not as flexible, right? It requires stopping and starting thing. And again, this is something you probably wouldn't generally do. This one was a big deal early on. The 5913, for those of you who are not into hardware, was the first RAID card that didn't have a battery. Right? No cache battery. Yay, it was a good card. Um, and then the ESA3 and family, all of those guys followed on. There's no more batteries. Well, one of the things that those cards did was um, beyond, beyond the battery was they actually used, they were, they were much better at the throughput with the larger blocks and VIO didn't understand that. And so it caused a very big performance problem. It really, really killed performance on the, uh, if VIOS was using internal disk with these high-end RAID cards, you're like, well, it's a high-end card. Yeah, okay, but VIO didn't understand that, okay. Um, now VIO, all the supported versions for, going quite a ways back, that's all fixed. So you see the sliders dead in the middle now because the, those two have, have gained parity there. Spreading storage across arms, you know, like Brad said earlier, it's, it just balances, it optimizes, right? It goes across. And, you know, the problem with um, using internal disk with VIO is not so much, right? I gotta somehow build the volume across RAID sets and, you know, um, there's just a lot of monkey business there. But again, this is not the environment we recommend for VIO. We recommend uh, agreed. VIO. And your know, VIO should never be there. Um, but if we separate that again, you know, to the storage for the workloads, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that is out on the SAN, then you've 
you have got this equivalence and you could actually argue it's a little better on the sand because you can get it to uh, happen uh, automatically by default you know sure. that whole tiering and uh, hot spot analysis yep. um but you know uh, that that said you know for simplicity i'm still with you on the ibmi side but hey that's what that's one of those where yeah you know, i feel that we could you know in a modern day environment drag it a little more towards the middle but um if you have to if you have to repurpose the size of your vios adapter uh, Vios environments, I, I bet you that people would just say, yeah, just take it offline, put the new disks in and rebuild it. It'll be quicker. It, it probably will be. And 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 this is one. So this this actually comes from an actual true customer experience back in the day where um, early on, if you uh, one of the limitations was IBM I no, did not at the time, if you had some SSDs, IBM I didn't report that the storage was on SSD to the client. And so there was no way for, for IBM I to, to, to leverage those SSDs very well. Um, but VIO did. And so in the VIO world, we said, oh, good, we've got a, a bunch of SSDs and a bunch of spinning disk. And so we, we used VIO server. And, that, and at the time, IBM was very strongly recommending, even with internal disk, use VIO server because of these capabilities. And the problem we ran into was trying to get to the point where we could mirror the storage was just a gigantic pain in the butt. Um, and, you know, support's favorite thing was mirror at the at the client level, the guest level. Well, of course, because you sell twice as yeah, much. Yeah, twice storage. as much storage, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and if you have dual VIOS, that's fine. You know, again, you're still selling twice as much storage, but, and, and Brad mentioned earlier, the client where he's got it set up where it's, it's, it's kind of janky because if you take down one VIO server, now there's the whole remirror thing that has to go on. And, yeah. you know, so yeah. that's... And if you saw all the messages that come up, you would think that the world was on fire. I mean, yeah. it really is like you've ripped someone's left arm off. It's okay, I'm going to put it back. But, you know, I don't know. Yeah. There's blood coming everywhere. Yeah, it was, what was that Men in Black where the, where the guy shoots the dude's head off and then it grows back? He, goes, yeah. he says, well, now I have to tell... He says, uh, you know... I can't believe he did that. He says, I didn't know it was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or I did the old Monty Python, you know, uh, it's just a flesh wound. It's just a flesh wound, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing about IBM I mirroring, we know about IBM I mirroring, and it's a one-to-one -one thing. And if one drive fails, then that drive is gone. And when you put a new one back, or Hot Spare puts a new one back for you, it has to re-mirror just one drive. It's great. Yeah. Okay. But in BIO, you're mirroring volume groups not mirroring drives. And so if you have four, four and four, when you add the new four, you have to then mirror the whole group. Okay. Okay. That much is fine. I don't have a problem with the logic there because I had four drives. Now I added four to mirror and now they're the same. Cool. But the problem comes when there's a drive failure. IBMI stops using the dead guy. Fair enough. VIOS stops using the whole group, this whole group gone, right? And I have to fix the group and re-mirror everything, okay? And here's where it really gets ugly is if you do the math. In IBM I, let's say I had eight drives mirrored four by four. One of them is already dead. I have a 14% chance the second failure will take me down. If I have 20 drives mirrored, 10 by 10, it's only 5% chance that I'm going to go down. If I'm mirroring volume groups, though, that same 4 by 4, 57% chance the second failure takes me down, compared to 14. And with 20 drives, it only drops to 52%. It's still more than half likely that the second drive will be in the other mirrored half right and take me down right? yeah yeah people don't just don't do this you know no. if, if you're gonna have yeah you can have your vios have that in a mirror pair everything else needs to be in the sand if right. you're thinking about using old school fee scuzzy then yep. unless you really know your use case then don't do this it no. may seem cheaper it's cheaper for a reason yep and then just a pause to reflect on NVMe because NVMe is, is the newest, right? And yeah. everybody, um, well, not everybody loves them, but um, they are way cool. 
And, um, you know, it's kind of funny that the, we started this whole idea of doing this presentation together because we were talking about NVMe drives. Exactly. Right. And um, it should be noted that if you're using a pair of NVMe drives, you, you think of them as just two physical things. But the truth is that they have to be sliced up into, into slices because IBM I needs to see more disk arms for its happiness level, right? To co cover the IO queues. So they might show up as, let's say, a whole bunch of 200 gig disks or 400 gig, some number. You got to pick a number. And the drives are mirrored from card to card. You would never mirror two drives on this card to each other. That would be what, what would you call that? Dumb, I think. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, it's not even possible. Uh, yeah. yeah, I did try. Did you? <laughs> I did. Yeah, I've got I've got way too much hardware. No, it doesn't. It won't let you do that. The, the whole right. adapter protection kicks in at that point. Sure, and and that's and that's you know one of the things about IBM I mirroring is it's always it tells you the level of of your mirroring support, which is which is good. So it's pretty smart. Um, and we say you know it's fabulously unlikely. Is it impossible if one two hundred gig drive dies on NVMe A? And is, is, it, is it likely that the rest of those drives are not also dead? I mean, because you probably lost the whole module, right? Yeah, the most likely thing is that there has, has been a problem with the adapter card that it sat in, whether that's through the interface, through interruption, you know, a, a firmware update, and it took the entire the, you know, 16 times uh, 200 gig devices offline. Yeah. Which, which sounds terrifying, but there is an exact copy in another card sat there. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah and, and, it, and that's exactly what it comes down to, right? That's why IBM I is protecting you in that mirrored space. Yeah. Right. And the recovery on that is much easier. So it, yeah, these, these adapter cards aren't that expensive. And you know, we say adapter cards, they can actually U.2. So they, they look like discs. Um, if yeah. you're really interested, shameless plug. There's a video I did on unboxing a, a Power Nine, and you'll you'll see them in there. Anyway, stick stick a third one in, and then if one fails, there's an option that says build the configuration of the the, the failed one based on the new one. Great, add it to the array, start the mirroring process. No downtime, um, and you, you'll barely notice the performance impact. Uh, yeah. The thing that will alarm you more is the number of messages that you get whilst you're doing it. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's the one thing is is you can can get a little overwhelmed that way, but just understand what they are and then you're then you're comfortable, right? Sure. Uh, so uh, back to that host mirror disk replacement, and and this is kind of the last nail in the in the coffin of the use of VIO server as an internal disk on internal disk, right? Is when you replace a dead guy in IBM I, it's copying one disk, right? Big deal. Yep. When you're cop when you're replacing a mirrored disk in VIO server, you're replace you're mirroring the whole volume group. That's the problem. So now I got to copy 100% of everything, right? So again, we said don't do it. This is just another reason why. And um and then, you know, hot spare, IBM I all day, all day, in mirroring too. Yep. Some people don't realize that you can have hot spares in mirrored environment in IBM I for a long time. IO? No. And then duplication of the hosted disks, right? Now, again, if you're on the SAN, Brad mentioned it, flash copy. No How problem. many of you use flash copy? <laughs> All day, man. That thing is golden. Internal disk? No. Don't really want to do it. Um, IBM I, you can do it, though, because you could you can copy them in different ways, um, but you can actually just do create NWS storage based on this disk, you can literally run a, a copy it within that internal uh, space. Can't be in use, of course, while you're copying it. So there's that, but you can in fact make, make the- uh... hey, You know, that can be part of your backup strategy for this. If you've got an outage window and I've got people where I take those guest partitions down, I literally duplicate the disks with the command that you said, you know, give me a new disk based on the old one. Yep. Uh, and then I bring that disk back online and back it up later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's much, much faster. And I also do that just before operating system upgrades. Because uh, yes. my rollback is, uh, oh, you don't like that, sir? Fine. Just shut it down and I'll put the other disks back as exactly as they were. As we like to say, the undo button. Yeah. Right? Finally, yes. A, a sort of like the equivalent of the, the snapshotting undo that you get in SANS on internal storage. Yep. 
And then um, SSD support, we mentioned this. Um, basically, you know, can the hosted SSD appear to the client as SSD? You know, that's yes. And um, what this does allow is that, you know, specifying unit SSD uh, for objects in IBM I, right? If you're not familiar with that back in the, oh, seven, one, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was indeed seven one one of the sort of mid tier uh, TR points TR seven TR eight somewhere around there, yeah. uh, but I mean the the truth of this is in both environments now with flash core modules or MVME, you know this is not an issue. You just yeah. th there is no place for spinning disk anymore. Uh, yeah. It is cheaper to buy MVME in most cases than it is to buy um, uh, SSDs or HDDs. So even the slower spinning disks are slower. Again, another shameless plug. I did a presentation on that, and I I just couldn't believe how much faster and how much cheaper they were. So potentially twelve x faster on reads, and potentially half the cost on a standard configuration P10 server. Yeah, and I'm not talking about the storage cost. I'm talking about the entire hardware cost in half. Yeah, and and the space requirements are dramatically less. Um, you know, heat generation less. Yeah, hardware maintenance less. Yeah, simplicity Cabling of management. Less, you know, <laughs> just, you know, the whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I swear to you, they did this by accident because when did IBM make something cheaper, better, and faster? You know, yeah. you, normally you've got to sacrifice one of those three. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, I, f I found this, this laying in my desk. This is a 16 gigabit, 16 gigabyte USB stick. Okay. See how tiny that thing is? It, there, there's the, the memory is smaller than the USB attachment. Right. Crazy. Next thing you know, that'll be terabytes. <laughs> um, Without a doubt. And that's where we're going with all this stuff, right? Oh, unbelievable. So um, one cool thing I will say about IBM I, if you're doing hosting of internal disk, when you initialize, when you create network server storage on IBM I, and it goes out and builds that thing, when you go to install to that disk, IBM I says, oh, it's already formatted bang, and it goes from zero to 99 instantly, right? So that's a really cool thing. Whereas um, when you're in, in um, MPIV, or sorry, in hosted disk on VIO, it's got to write the thing full of zeros. Now, SanDisk, and this is something that's always kind of irritated me back, the very first SAN implementation that I did was on a big power six, with and it, the SAN was an entire rack, entire rack, full of maybe one terabyte drives at the time. Yeah. Maybe, probably In, not. Initializing that thing, I think, took four days. Yeah. Right? Writing zeros to all those drives. It was nuts. And that was VIO with, you know, that one I think actually was old enough. It was VSCSI, but done, nonetheless, it was days to initialize the storage. Nowadays, with the Flash System 5200, if you've hooked that thing up, you know, you can initialize a 35 gig drive in like, I don't know, is it 10 seconds? Yeah. Something like that. It's uh, and to be honest, yeah, it's ready. It, even before it's finished fully initializing itself, it's ready for use. Uh, yeah. it, it is stunningly fast. Yeah, exactly. So the SANS have finally figured out that, look, this guy's writing nothing but zeros. I'm just going to stand here and watch him go by. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. Uh, but you know, we, we need to emphasize the importance of that because that that whole initialize the, uh, the machine. If you're using traditional spinning disks and you have a failed upgrade and you want to use that save twenty one to go back from seven four to seven three, yeah, right, you have to reinitialize the machine. So before you can take any data at all, uh, you're going to spend somewhere between four and twenty four hours, right, reinitializing a machine. Yes, that's based on you know standard. Yeah, you know, three hundred gigabyte, uh, three hundred gigabyte drives. It's hours to do that. Whereas in this process, you literally blow away the disks, put them back, or if you had to recreate the disks, doesn't matter. You know, it's going to take five minutes per disk to recreate them, and then when you initialize them, it is seconds. Yeah, you know? it yeah. starts the process. Says, okay, I don't need to initialize. It goes to one uh, to ninety nine percent, finishes actually mounting it, and you've got the drive online in in probably fifteen to twenty seconds. Yeah, and, and if you're one of those poor souls that was <clears throat> stricken with 10,000 RPM drives at you know 1.1 terabyte or whatever, oh man, 
right? The, the days you're talking about for initializing those kind of things. So, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I remember the first time I came across the 530 <laughs> gigabyte drive, then it was the 10K one. Yeah. And I, you know, fortunately for me, it was a development machine. There was nothing in the documentation that told me it's 22 hours for that thing to initialize. You know, I started the process and I, I sat there thinking, well, yeah, two, four hours, it'll be done. You know, eight yeah. hours went by and I'm looking rather embarrassed in front of the client. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, went, went back to my hotel room, had a night's sleep, came back and it was still running, by which time IBM had responded and said, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's normal. Yep. <laughs> not in the world I live in, it's not. No, and that's, you know, and even when uh, when you have that environment and, and you configure it with hot spare, you say, oh, good, the hot spare will rebuild immediately. Well, it starts rebuilding immediately. There's yeah. nothing immediate about the rebuild. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a long time. So um, if you compare the two environments when you're talking about hosting, well, it's kind of sort of the same now because realistically, what can you host? IBM I, AIX, Linux, right? And you know, it used to be different, but all those other things aren't hosted on IBM I anymore. And chiefly, that's because of SAN storage. Why would you host on IBM I when you have a SAN, right? Um, if you have ESX, connect it directly to the SAN. Why connect it to IBM I anymore? It just yeah. doesn't make economic uh, sense to do that. Now, we're seeing increasingly that it makes more economic sense for us to join the ESX and the Windows on the SAN. Um, and yeah. who, who's to say, you know, way down the line, you know, power 11, power 12, that that just won't be the case. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would be absolutely shocked or would not be shocked at all for them to say um, internal disk is no longer an option. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just, um, yeah, but, here's and, your sand. And that doesn't mean you need virus, ladies and gentlemen. You can directly connect it. It's just saying that you know, storage is becoming more of a commodity. And, and, yes. and, and that's a good thing. Yep. Every day. It becomes more of a commodity, becomes faster and smaller and cheaper. Yeah. And I, one of the, one of the things I talk about in one of my presentations. So um, some of you may remember the 9332 model 400. It was the discs that you put on an AS 400 back in 1988. And it was three U's high in the rack, right? Full rack width, three U's high, full depth, great big honking thing, 400 megabytes. <laughs> yeah. And it was $16,000 to buy one of these. It had 220 volt power at a cable the size of your finger going into it, right? And uh, it was a few years ago now when you could buy, um, so if you bought four of those, the four of those together then was 1.6 gigabytes. And it was then $64,000. $64,000 for 1.6 gigabytes. And a few years ago, there was an SSD available, and this is just so this is just tells about timeline because it was before um, uh, NVMe. There was a single 16 terabyte SSD for then storewise, okay, that was $64,000. Okay, so same price, you went from 1.6 to 16T, right? So that's that's not a thousand times, that's 10,000 times bigger capacity for the same money. Yeah, uh, you know, and that, that line keeps going. If you draw that back to when your father first started, you know, um, and I'll go to 69 rather than 67 because it was a million pounds a megabyte back in 69. <laughs> I remember that because they were talking about the amount of time that they did, the, the money that they spent to get yeah. some storage done for the moon uh, yep. shot. It's um, and it'll carry on. It'll carry on getting easier and easier, and more and more storage. Yeah, yep. there, there are these stats that say we actually created more new storage was record and consumed last year than in all of the other storage ever added up together. We we just got so much crap out there. I'm not I'm oh, not yeah. quite sure how that works with GDPR, but hey, go figure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. All right. Well, support for special raid. Yeah. Okay. AIX wins here, but let's don't do it. Let's let the SAN do it, right? Um, can I disconnect virtual disk with the client operational again? Yes, I can do it on VIO, but why would I want to do it, right? Use the SAN. And, and then if you have the SAN, you can do that. You can remove them, guys. Make sure you're not actually no data on them, right? That's important, yep. right? Um, so summary of internal disk support, um, you know, A, for IBM I, because that's where it's always been 
super strong. And, you know, for internal disk, VIO, just, just don't do it. I mean, if you have a real small test environment, and that's the one I just set up a few weeks ago, the guy's going to have two IBMIs, um, I think three small Linuxes and an AIX. And they're all just testing stuff. Okay. You know, and he doesn't have a sand handy. Okay, I get it. That 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 works. But for production environment, just don't do it. Just, uh, just hell no. I, it, and to be honest, it, it's one of those. There should just be a line through the section on the right hand side that just says use a sand. If you can't afford a sand, then do it on IBM I. It, it, it's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. Right. Or we'll separate the two workloads out. Have your IBM I running on one and put you, put your AIX on another. Yeah. And so when you get to these advanced technologies, and I call these advanced technologies. Um, We've got a handful of things here that are um, not used by the average IBM I shop necessarily. Um, active memory expansion, right? Which ironically is compression, right? That's the yeah. thing that always cr cracks me up is we call it expansion, but it's really compression. Marketing, um, marketing sounds marketing. It sounds like you can you can charge more for uh, expanding something you can for compressing it. That's right. <laughs> IBM I doesn't even participate in that. So, you know, with VIO, yes, you can do active memory expansion. And um, what that does, of course, is compress the memory to make it look like there's more memory than there really is. Okay, cool. Right. And, you know, VIO server supports that. Active memory sharing, um, you know, for the host, IBM I doesn't do that. That's not a thing. Right. This is, uh, but you can do it in enterprise edition of. Um, BIO server. And a note, Power 9, you get Enterprise Edition automatically. Previous hardware generations, you had to step up, right? It was more money to get Enterprise Edition. So um, included at no additional charge with Power 9 and up. I fully expect that on Power 10. I haven't looked because I haven't sold any E1080s yet. I expect this, expect that to also be the, the case. And I totally agree. And active memory sharing is one of those hidden gems of the power environment uh, that I do hope one day will, you know, run a standard on the I side. This is one of the few compelling arguments that says, you know, Fios and San is your man. Yep. Yep. Um, live partition mobility. We've mentioned this one several times. And and now, careful here. We're, again, we're talking about host. So IBM I, if IBM I is your host, you will not be doing any live partition mobility because it doesn't do it. As a guest, yes, IBM I can be that guest that is moved back and forth. Yep. And of course, to do that, you need to have uh, enterprise edition of VIO server. And of course, 100% of all client hardware must be virtual. We mentioned that for, you know, uh, that's for your storage, for your networking, for your tape connections, everything. 100% of it has to be virtualized. If there's anything not virtualized, then it says, sorry, you're not a candidate. You don't can't participate. So, But if you don't mind it not being live, if you don't mind a little bit of downtime, then that left-hand side has a very compelling argument. You know, we, we move people between hosts all the time. Uh, and you know what? It also helps with that whole technology change. It protects from that. So as you're moving between a power eight, a power nine, a power nine, a power 10, uh, that you can have a, a very seamless move if you're prepared to tolerate a little bit of downtime and have I hosting I moving you across. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, there is, there is, um, you can really get that time down to just minutes, really. I mean, if it's done right, it's literally power down sys, make sure everything's done and flushed and then power up on the new box. Right. So um, there's absolutely ways to do that. Yeah, and, and it's we, a very consistent copy when you power it up on the other machine. And that's it. There isn't, yeah. there isn't a lot of tidy up work to do afterwards. Exactly. That's really part of the key there. Yep. It's very, very tidy. Partition suspend resume uh, again, same thing. Um, realistically um, you need enterprise edition. And again, it's really that, that all virtual thing again, don't know of anybody who does suspend resume. No, it doesn't lend itself very well to an IBM I application. Forget the operating system now, but you think about a typical you know, ERP solution um, uh, that's running on, on an IBM I product. They, they don't like the thought that they were offline snoozing for a while. That, that, right. So, um, yeah, I think that instead you would be just moving the machine to a uh, live partition mobility to another hardware so you could spin down the, the chassis to save power 
yeah, I, I don't see this as being a big deal. Exactly. Yep. I totally agree. Um, now, when you look at dual host support, right, and this is, we love dual host support because it gives us redundancy. Yep. And, um, you know, so for, for the IBMI side, yes, you can have dual hosts. And as, as Brad mentioned, he has a customer that way. Uh, but yeah, twice the disc, which, you know, hey, what could be better? Sell twice the disc. Um, but you're mirroring at the client level then. And, you know, so it's a lot of extra work. If you do take down one of those IBMI partitions, it's going to remirror everything. So lots of extra work going on there. Um, uh, absolutely. I, I'm just tempted now to put an RFE in to say, well, if I have DB2 mirror, can I have each of the hosts in the DB2 mirror acting as a, as, as a, as a, as a host for my IBMI partition so I can have them? <laughs> oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I just want to see the look on Steve Will's face when I propose it. <laughs> yeah, but the flaw in your logic is that those NWS storage devices are in the IFS, and the IFS is handled through PowerHA, right? Okay. Within within DB Mirror. So what happens is both requests, one comes directly to this copy, the other one gets reflected to the same copy. Uh, you're running on my parade. Can I just put them in different <laughs> IASPs? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, it is an IASP. Yeah. The, and the IASP is then replicated, but you can't access that one because PowerHA says this is the master. Yeah, but I'm going to have two because I've got my mirror and they're going to be replicating in different directions for a, totally po for a totally pointless and very expensive solution. Yeah, I'm going to call it the Apple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, where did you get this idea, sir? Well, you see, I was in California and I drove near this really cool building in Cupertino. <laughs> Absolutely, it was a giant donut. I was going to thought, I, you know, I thought I was going to get in there and get some Dunkin' Donuts, but it, apparently it doesn't sell those. Apparently not, yeah. <laughs> it's the strangest shaped apple I've ever seen in my life. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so again, you know, you get to the, to the mirroring and NPIV, well, then, you know, that same disc um, you can have multiple paths. The, the, the typical standard is four paths um, to disk, um, two paths from IBMI, one to each VIO server, and then from VIO server, two paths each, one through one switch. And right, so you end up, do the math, two times two, still four. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's absolutely the, the, the way to go and um, very solid. Absolutely. All right. So that runs us out of comparison points yeah so that is always the first half of this this, this <laughs> discussion um <laughs> no so i i think that 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 was an incredible run through i mean i i don't know that's self-effacing but you did all the work here which is why i'm saying that i uh, i am literally here hunting the glory that comes along with this so uh, i think that we could do with a little bit of a summary uh, of, of what we've done and what we've talked about and I, I don't know, I, are you happy for me to have a first stab at that? Sure, absolutely. I think that would be very appropriate. Okay, so I think what we've learned here is if you have a simple environment that is primarily IBMI, so I'm going to put some numbers here, you can dispute the numbers, but if, if you've got between two and four partitions uh, that are all IBMI, it's a no-brainer. It's I hosting I, unless you unless you've got some edge cases about a, a high availability or partition mobility. But equally, if you've got 122 IBMI partitions, then you shouldn't be using I hosting I. Okay, uh, and so I, I see that. If you've got an environment where you've got a lot of AIX and a lot of Linux, and you want IBM I along it, and you want to share the storage, share the network adapters, you know, it's Vios all the way through. So think about what it is that you're trying to achieve. You know, absolute cutting edge performance, Vios. Uh, absolute uh, scalability and you know, that 24-7 that uptime partition mobility, advanced functions with being able to uh, overshare and share memory. Uh, yep, yeah, it's Vios. But in the real world where most of the IBM I shops sit, which is the P5 and P10 world, that sort of, I need the machine available. Yes, I need it 6.7 days a week, but I've got no problem with having the machine down for an hour or two hours every day because at some point, you know, even my shift goes to sleep or, you know, my processes are finished. 
then the whole IBMI hosting IBMI is a very compelling argument. If you've got IBMI skills and you don't want to become a networking fiber SAN expert, then IBMI hosting IBMI is a very compelling argument. Um, so for me, if it's a simple environment uh, that's IBMI, stick with IBMI for the host. If you've got a more complicated environment and you want to get the most out of VMware and, um, sorry, not VMware, of, of Power VM and also the AIX Linux world, uh, get a few of the, the funky features out of uh, partition mobility, then you need Vios in your life. Yeah, I think that's that's very, very well summarized. I, I think um, just the one thing I would highlight is is that some of the items are, are, are trip switches, right? Like I want NPIV on my SAN, you kind of got to have IBMI. I want to, I want to do live partition mobility. Well, then I, I kind of got to do VIO server. I just got to do it. Right. Yep. So those are the, there are some things that are literally just a switch. And you know, the one thing we haven't said, you can actually have both of those. You can have IBMI hosting IBMI and Vios hosting IBMI on the same physical server. Sure. I'm not, I'm not saying you should, but you definitely can. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And, um, I have actually used that as a migration method to get customers to the SAN. Yep. Right. We, we were literally um, carved out, you know, just enough slots and, and got, you know, one fiber card, one ethernet card and built one VIO server booting off the SAN <laughs> and then started doing, you know, one drive at a time, right. Migrating those disks over to the SAN storage. And then when we're done, you just need the, the outage to to boot um, to, for the load source copy. Yep. Right. And then now you got everything on SAN. And so now the new machine is sitting next door, right? Um, or probably above it, typically above or below, right? In the rack. And now you IPO on the new machine off the SAN. So yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a doable thing. Um, again, not recommended. Um, but then I've done some unorthodox migrations for customers where you go, uh, you know, our tape drive hasn't worked for years. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, um, I agree. If, if you're all IBMI and a small number of partitions and you don't need mobility, man, IBMI is your go-to. Um, and whether that's on spinning disk, probably not. SSD could be NVMe, love it a lot. Yeah, right? yeah. all day long. All day Absolutely. long, right? Um, then yeah, sure. That's, that's cool beans. But as soon as you start getting into those, the, the big numbers, okay. Um, then yeah, you're going to want, you're going to want NPIB or you're going to kill yourself with connections. You're going to want that SAN support. Um, and you're going to want the redundancy of being able to, to have multiple VIO servers. No question about it. So, all right. So you've got to look at your own scorecard. Yeah, what are your hot buttons? I couldn't yeah. agree more. Uh, it's down to what you want as to which of the solutions is best. Absolutely. It, it really comes down to that. And, you know, you always got that guy in the room that raises his hand and says, so I already did IBM I, but I really need to hook up to a SAN. Okay, well, we, we just mentioned that it can be changed, right? And, and, and as always, you start to think about this now, right now is a really good time to think about this. If you're a customer that's still on power eight, or if you went to power nine, right at the beginning of power nine, and now you're kind of wondering if that power nine, um, you know, needs to be a power 10, right? We don't know when power 10 is going to be here, probably this year. Um, for the, for you the found, If you follow standard ro IBM ro uh, roadmaps, you know, once the enterprise is there, you'd expect to see something you know, w within 12 months on the scale outside. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's our anticipation, yeah. but you need to have those discussions now, because if you wait till your business partner shows up with a, with a proposal, now everybody start, now they're on go mode. Now there's, Oh, it's this much money. Oh, it fits in our budget. Oh, it's the right thing to do. And, and, you know, one of the things that's been a hot button of mine is prepare for the future. When you're doing that upgrade, don't buy just enough memory and just enough processors and just enough storage. Don't do it. Because then when the boss comes and says, can we run Linux on our power system? 
you can say yes. And you literally can't because you've virtualized, you have your BIO servers, you have your SAN, you know, um, and you have enough extra capacity to prove that it works. You know, uh, you, just to echo that point, when you buy the new hardware, getting a better deal on processor activation, uh, core licenses, extra RAM, much easier deal when you're buying the hardware. Yes. So I've got plenty of customers who say, okay, can we over egg this slightly? And so I've got this much storage and I want you to hold back 30% of the storage. Don't allocate it to anything. I, I want the magic screwdriver. I want it to be, you could be able to put it in without any downtime. I can do that, uh, but just put it there and configure it that way. And we'll do that for them so that yep. during the life of the product, as they acquire other companies, we turn up the, 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 the power of the machine so that it doesn't slow down. Um, some people will say, well, why didn't you have it fast to begin with? Because people complain if, you know, even if it went from taking an hour to taking one second, if it takes three seconds, two years later, they complain because it's three sure. times longer. You know, they forget the fact that it used to take an hour. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and it is, um, and you know, the good news is on a lot of these things, for example, in the flash system, if you buy a flash system 5200 with NVMe storage, and you buy, let's say, eight flash modules. Well, it used to be that, oh, I want to expand that. Well, I got to buy at least four more modules to create a new RAID. Not anymore. You can add one module and it will integrate it into the RAID. So that much is a, is, is a big advantage. But if you have extra capacity right to start with, then it gives you that ability to immediately react. You know, are you acquiring a company? Or does somebody say, oh, well, you know what? Our ERP vendor has a new version. We'd like to make a new partition, okay, so that we can test the new version, right? Hey, flash copy to the rescue. Wow, right? And that flash copy doesn't take zero storage, but it takes a whole lot less. But you got to have some room on the sand to handle it. Yeah. And if you're virtualized, that one extra partition isn't going to cost you anything. So really is a um, is the right thing to do. So if your business partner hasn't talked to you about virtualization, if all they ever do is give you another machine that has a little more RAM and a faster processor and a few gigabytes more disk, if that's the only proposal you ever get from them, you need to find a new partner. You really do. Amen. Uh, because you're, you're being shortchanged. Um, there's so much that this platform can do. IBM I and Power Systems, you know, scalable, reliable, wins year after year after year for most reliable server. It's awesome. But if you're treating it like that old thing that used to have white paint, then you're not getting what you're paying for out of the machine. Yeah. So, so, so where do you go next, guys? If you want to know more about this, uh, you know, well, first, my, my first recommendation is contact your local. Uh, well, that bless you. Thank you. Right. But what my first recommendation, honestly, is contact your local common user group. Okay. Yes. Or your local IBM I user group. Talk to people who are actually doing it. If you want a proper, um, you know, a proper opinion, oh, that, that was very opinionated. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you want um, an opinion from people who can speak properly, <laughs> he says, trying to dig himself out of a hole. If you want to, you know, get, by all means, Larry and I'd be delighted to talk to you about it. It's one of the reasons we do this, but we honestly don't care if you buy it somewhere else. Just do something, okay? And if it works for you and you don't buy it from us, then make sure you buy us a coffee at the next common event that we're all at. That's what we want, okay? Exactly. Yeah, it, it support your local user group, your common user group, whether you're, whether you're in Europe, whether, whether you're in North America um, or, or, or anywhere. Um, there are so many good resources. Um, you know, Common US, for example, right now, if you happen to join, even as an individual member, you get access to all the boot camps for the whole year, unlimited. And you, you know, those things are system administration, development, domino, um, and there's more of them coming. And you can watch those sessions multiple times in any order you want, right? Learn the piece that you need. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we're seeing the pandemic is finally maybe kind of gasping toward an end. Um, it's well, not and we're all getting yet. better at living with it now. The treatments are better, the vaccines are better. And so, you know, with a little yeah. bit of luck, if you are seeing this presentation for a second time, it could be because yeah, uh, Dr. Franken and I are actually doing it together in a room somewhere. Exactly. We... And, you know, and just a little shameless plug for a small company that my, my son works for. Um, 
they actually run IBM Power Systems, 192 Linux partitions running their SAP environment on in two data centers, great big enterprise class machines, and that's how they run all of their IT, and their name is Pfizer. And you've heard yeah. the name Pfizer. Just, just a little company then. A yeah. couple of times, right? Yeah. And I wish my son owned it, but of course he doesn't. Um, because then if he owned it, I'd be selling him those machines. But you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the kind of enterprise out there that's that's using this platform, right? Yeah. Um, all SAP HANA, 100 percent of their IT runs on that. And that's globally, right? That's a that's a global enterprise. So um, yeah, hopefully um, back in person where we're where we're presenting together, where we're sharing a, a beverage. Um, and able to, to sit down and talk about this kind of thing, what's the best way to go? And it's a passion uh, we both have, right? Educating Absolutely, people. it's how we met and it's the reason we're friends. You know, yep. uh, there are other things in our lives, but not many of them are as good as IBMI. That's right, there you go. <laughs> Um, All right. Well, I think that brings us to a wrap pretty much. Doesn't yeah, it, if right? you're still with us, we're very grateful. If you have any ideas of other things that my learned friends and I should ramble on about, you know, reach out to us, give us some suggestions, and the next webinar might be dedicated to you. There you go. Thanks, Brad, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care Absolutely. now, my friend. See you.